Shields up, Ironbreakers. Rurikon here coming at you with another episode of the Third Fleet Podcast. If I'm not mistaken, this is episode nine. With me is the man, the myth, the legend, Gaijin Hunter himself. And today we have a very special guest, Mr. Band Dino, who is uh, the resident monster hunter lore expert. And uh, because you guys have asked us to talk about lore so many times today, we're going to go ahead and do that. So, hello, Mr. Gaijin. How are you doing today? Doing good. Hopefully not coughing a lot. <laughs> hello, Mr. Van <laughs> Sorry, Dino. Guys. How are you doing today? I'm doing well. I'm just a bit sleepy, that's all. Yeah, we, uh, we apparently woke him up uh, mm-hmm. because we uh, misscheduled the podcast. So these are things that happen in a live podcasting environment. Uh, also, if you guys notice like strange delays, I would like to uh, call to your attention that we have someone in Portugal... We have a train going by as well, which is great for background noise. We have someone in <laughs> Japan, and we have someone in the United States. So we have people all over the world, and latency is going to be a thing. So if there's like awkward silences or anything like that, it's because someone is still hearing the other person speak, so do not be surprised. But today's episode is special because it is going to be focused around lore, but before we dive into the lore, we always like to do a little bit of chit-chat before we get started. So... Uh, Since me and Gaijin have talked at length about Rise, and Bandino is our first guest, what are your thoughts on Rise so far? It is... It is... It's just fun. That's all... That's the best way to describe it. (laughs) Oh, man. I've sunk so many hours into it. And and the game's not even fully out yet. Yeah, I think most hunters are just like diving in and like blowing hundreds upon hundreds of hours. People are like speed running Mizutsune trying to get like sub fives and whatnot with uh, as many weapons as possible. Things are going completely and utterly insane. It's a demo and there, there's a lot of people that have put in way over 100 hours. Like, I don't know what you're clocking at this point, but I know that I put it in over 100 hours and Gaijin as well. So that's some pretty crazy stuff. So I Dino, I I've got to ask... Uh, sorry, I was going to ask. Um, yeah, I'm curious about your playtime and also what weapons are you using? I actually don't know what weapons you, you like to use, so I'd love to hear. I put in, I think, maybe 70 plus hours into the demo alone, and I've mostly been using. Uh, I've also been using greatsword, hammer, dual blades, heavy bow gun, and there's one more. I'm trying to remember what it was. Oh, and hunting horn. <laughs> that sweet sweet hunting horn everybody's been playing the crap out of hunting horn um, they my daughter it. says she they might made into it, a god dang monster we're gonna have to have a lore video or tweets from you about the lore of the hunting horn how it became <laughs> a monster and now hunted by the guild <laughs> um so were you one of the people that really enjoyed the Clutch Claw in World, or were you also a part of the club that's like, man, Clutch Claw really, really friggin' sucks? Because like, so many people kind of like hated the the Clutch Claw and tenderized mechanics, and whatnot. I'm curious to hear your thoughts on that. I I think it was just okay. Nothing nothing extremely bad, just okay. The only reason why I say it's okay was just because of the flint shot, and that's about it. Yeah. Is the the thing is that I've I've actually had comments of people saying that the 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 wire bug is uh, a gimmick and that it's actually a a, da- a step backwards in regards to the clutch claw and I've just been like, what what are people smoking nowadays? Like, well, what is, what is going on? <laughs> I mean, you also have the thing. I, go I gotta say that um, what was I about to say? I think the clutch claw. It was like super experimental and um the thing with World and Iceborne, I've always been like in this party when saying that those games were really experimental because they were trying new things, much like Monster Hunter Try. And it's not too surprising to say the least that if the the Clutch Claw would get such a response from people. Some people dislike it, others hate it, some people like underwater, others did not. Yeah, I would say that people have to keep in mind that, you know, anything that the teams do, they're standing on the shoulders of the game that came before it. So the cool thing about the main games is that they are they have enough guts to try something new that changes the integral format of the game. So 
you know, there's going to be some hits and misses, maybe like, uh, you know, they'll, like the training room, for example. You know, it's a great idea that they implemented, and now Rise is going to take that a much bigger step forward. But it doesn't say anything bad about the first implementation of such a system. So I think people need to cut them some slack, so to say. Yeah. I like I like the experimentation with stuff, but uh, I think that personally, I think that Wirebug is like just a superior version of the Clutch Claw in so many ways because it's not it doesn't feel as random because like so many times you would throw a clutch claw into the monster's head you would end up in the monster's tail uh a lot of times you would throw up the clutch claw you'd be trying to like get uh a wall bang or something like that and you would just like clutch at the wrong time because it's a little bit awkward to judge oh is this going to be an opening is this not going to be an opening and you're just like spamming clutch claw whenever the monster is not enraged and it just gets completely and utterly crazy but um, out of all of the weapons that you've played in the demo so far, which one did you enjoy the most? It would probably be Greatsword. With the added agility and stuff, it's basically become a kind of new weapon, at least in my opinion. Yeah, with uh, the friggin' power sheath and whatnot. Basically, I, I almost never sheathed the weapon normally. I would always just like power sheath. That's kind of like when I started really getting better at the Greatsword in, in Rise, because like when I started playing Greatsword in Rise, I was like, dude, I, I can't get a single like true charge slash off. This thing is really, is really not working out for me. But then I was just like, okay, now we power sheet instead of regular sheathing. Instantly get the bonuses. Use the wire bugs actually to leap onto the monsters with your weapon sheathed instead of using like the, the crazy two wire bug move, because no. that move, I, I just didn't like it all that much. It's... It really takes a lot of time to use that particular attack, which I got it off a few times, but I usually ended up getting knocked out of midair by by Camellios, essentially. <laughs> <laughs> Camellios I mean, is always there. He's, he, th those hitboxes, they're, they're not extremely generous or anything like that. No, 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 no. But it is to make up for the amount of aerial mobility that we have now. I don't know how else they can make up for that, because... You know, if you just have the, the regular hurt boxes that we had in, like, World, a lot of hunters are just going to be, like, invincible. You know, like, you, you get into a situation where, like, the insect glaive was, a lot of times, if you were in the air, you are almost untouchable on a lot of the monsters. I think that might be why they did that. I didn't think about that, but that could be it. Yeah. Because, like, at least with, for instance, the, the sword and shield, I would always be, like, trying to, to use the falling shadow, whatever it's called, whenever something's in there. I'm like, falling shadow, falling shadow, ne nonstop falling shadow. And then I would, like, get hit by something that it wouldn't even make that much sense. And I was like, well, I guess if I didn't get hit, this was going to be pretty abusive for me to just keep doing it over and over and over. So, yeah, I, I, I see why they did it, but it still doesn't feel quite natural <laughs> with, um, with the hitboxes. But um, I, think, uh, I think we should dive right into um, some lore here. And I think we would get started with like the, the creation of the universe, if, if you have any particular details in regards to that. Because I know that you did like uh, some work with My Name is Bife and whatnot uh, a while ago for Monster Hunter World, right? Yes. Oh, man, I want to forget about, I want to forget about those two videos. No offense to the guy, I just don't want to forget about him. I was back during my, I guess you could say, my darker thoughts on the series. Oh, wow. Oh, man. I was, I was not, I was really not aware of this. Like, so, but you, you did talk about the creation of the universe, right? In, I guess, in a way, it's, oh, man, it's. It's that great Dragon War stuff, which I honestly want to forget about thinking about. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, I, I didn't catch this conversation. So I was when I first heard from Rory when he was mentioning something about creation stories, I'm like, I'm not even aware that there's even lore out there talking about the creation of the world. So I was kind of like, hmm? Yeah, like I, mean, the, I mean, the most we got is, well... Um, the sapphire star from the new world, and that was that's about it. Yeah, so you know, I'm not that... sure if there's any official lore, right? That talking about the creation of the world. I mean, we have we could talk about the ancients, and there's all the myths and legends and stuff like that. But I don't know about like like going I could, back. To I could the swear I saw. I could, I could swear I saw something about some dragon forming the sky and another dragon forming the lands and 
and whatnot and some other crazy stuff like that. Maybe I'm confusing it with something else at this point. I'm might just that be going crazy. Was, that was from World with um Sapphire Star, the story of the Sapphire Star, how the child got to the new world and how the dragons essentially created the new world. I can't exactly remember how it played out, but essentially there was five different dragons, one creating the mountains, one creating the water, one creating the forest. I forgot what the other two were, but essentially it was that. Do you think that's a case of them just being poetic about it? Or like, you know, because like the, the, like the first fleet or whatever, being poetic about everything and like... Well, in one day there was a monster, and or do you actually think that that's like a lore thing that they in the world believe actually happened? It's hard to say because, but a lot of the legends, when it comes, especially when it comes to the older dragons, there's some truth to it. So, it's mean it might be something that they just that they just thought of some kind of belief they have, but at the same time, there might be some small truth to it. And might imply some future monsters, so it's really up to anyone's idea on that one. They probably they probably figured out the Rotten Veil was Dalamadur, and they're like, "That's it. We figured it out. Every single map was created by a monster." <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. So they do leave it uh, quite open to interpretation. I thought I thought it was going to be a little bit more set in stone, but you know, I, I haven't looked up that much in regards to to that That's- lore. That's the dark most, souls inside of you. Yeah. The most, the most I can say that's confirmed is that there was an ancient times where there were some monsters that were larger than they are now. Like, for example, for example, the Tigris we see today, they were actually a lot larger. They were actually a lot larger back in the old days. But as their environments changed and stuff, they became smaller. But the only real exception who who didn't grow any large smaller was Molten T Rex due to the environment he lives in. Nice. What uh, so what he's game larger is, because is, I'm sorry. What game is Molten T Rex from? Because like you guys, I'm I'm almost a world baby. I'm not exactly a world baby because I did start <laughs> with Try, but I didn't play too much of the older games. World was when I really just like poured in thousands of hours, literally thousands of hours. Uh, the previous games, like I play them a bunch, and now I've been playing more GU and whatnot. So, like when you throw out something like Molten Tigrex, I'm like, okay, what what game's that from? Because <laughs> I really don't know. He's from uh, Monster Hunter Four and Monster Hunter Four Ultimate. I played that, but I guess I didn't go. Well, that you far. never you never got to my second favorite non Elder monster in the series. I He's guess amazing. I you guess need to go I back didn't. and play that thing. God, I, I w- dude, if they would release it on the Switch, I would play it right now. I just don't want to play my 3DS. I really don't. Well, that's interesting. I didn't, I didn't know that there was a lore behind the reason why it's because it's much larger than the other tiger or t- 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 whatever the hell the monster is called. <laughs> it's T-Rex. Tigrex. <laughs> I, 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 I want to say it's Tigrex, even though officially it's Tigrex. I still like Tigrex more. Okay, Dino, where do you fall on this? It's. Since they pronounced it Tigrex and Iceborne, I've just been pronouncing it like that for the past for the past year now, actually. I'm I'm pretty sure they yeah, confirmed I'm, they officially confirmed that it was Tigrex. It was pronounced yeah. Tigrex, which yeah. kind of sucks. I'm trying, <laughs> I'm still trying to get out of the old habit. I can't do it. But yeah, it's it's larger in the game. And I love the fact that that monster starts out like really slow, like a like a like a steam engine. And then as he yeah. gets built up, he gets get like really aggressive and fast. Like I want to see a regular t-grex that size that'd be fun hmm. i really want to see a monster in the game that takes place in ancient times just so we can see some of that stuff but you oh, never know we don't know if they'll ever do that that's an idea the creation huh. of the guild when, <laughs> when hunters got their butts kicked do you do you know anything about the creation of the guild the most the most i know is they're basically the government force in the Monster Hunter universe, and their goal is to try to maintain a balance between humans and monsters. They want they want to try to have both both groups both groups monsters and humans to um to live harmon to live in harmony with one another to a point where they both don't interfere with each other's nature essentially. 
because there's yeah, the guild um, is the guild's been ahead. around for like hundreds of years i think in the in the universe of monster hunter and like you're saying there really are the governing body where they sort of define the culture of how everyone interacts with the world and they they keep things in check i think more so they keep the the hunters in check just as much as they keep the monsters in check yeah that's what i've that's what i've always loved about the guild we're not just hunting the monsters just because they're a problem. We're also doing it just to try to keep somewhat a balance between humans and monsters. Yeah, if you were to go out and just randomly start hunting off Tigrexes, like the guild would be on your ass. Like they they'd kill you or prison you or something. Like they won't allow that crap. See, this yeah. this now we've gotten to the crux of the issue, guys. Everybody's always wondering why Gaijin doesn't like investigations from Monster Hunter World. This is why. Because he's secretly working for the guild, and he's like, "Those are not official requests." Yes, you're killing I'm these monsters. <laughs> you're killing these they, monsters, and you're not authorized. They just commission do whatever they want in that game. At least that's the way I see it. Yeah. it it's for science, you know. Yeah, exactly. It's a science experiment. <laughs> We're gonna kill it and dissect it. Exactly. Well, well we saw how their captures or mackerels turned out. <laughs> yeah, it didn't didn't work out too well for some strange reason. <laughs> but yeah, the more you look into the guild though, like they they're it's kind of like a hardcore hierarchy. Like they've got like the the guild masters, the guild managers, the guild knights, the receptionists. Like there's a whole world building setting in there. Yeah. Like, is it like the army? Do you have like your your ranks and stuff? Like how how does how does stuff work with the guild? How do, how is the inner workings of the guild? Hmm. It's let me see. It's been a while. Um, for the most part, if I remember correctly, the guild masters they're the ones that head that act as the heads. But depending on whatever district of the guild you're on, there's always like at least one guild manager or one guild master, and I think. I think the guild master ranks above the guild manager, if I remember correctly. And then yeah, that's lower right. below them. And then lower below them is the guild knights and then the guild receptionists. So some of the receptionists are actually also guild knights. Like I think Becky from Becky, from yeah. The, <laughs> from the very first monster on her, if I remember correctly. Miss Bob Evans herself. You Rory, you wouldn't get the joke, but in America, there's a family restaurant called Bob Evans, and they all dress in like these country bumpkin like outfits. And it, it reminds me of the guild receptionist from Monster Hunter One, uh, Becky from Kokoto. She looks like she's a waitress from Bob Evans. <laughs> but yeah, I think you you got it right though. Like you got like the guild masters are like the regional managers for the guild, and they like to, you know they have like their areas that they they represent. Like you have like Dundorma, which is like the headquarters, and Loklak and Tanzia and Valhabar and stuff like that. So, like, those are those big Wyvarians that kind of run and oversee the guild's operation in a in a whole district region. Where like mm-hmm. smaller towns like Yukumo or or like Poke Village or whatever, they have their own guild managers. They're kind of like you know, it's kind of like having a store manager of a, and then a, a a regional manager of like a store. You know, you know, you got representatives, but I you. Dino, you'll have to correct me. I'm curious, though. Is there a hard rule that they have to be Wyvarian? I want to say that there is. I think so. I'm not I'm not 100% sure because, because there is more lore in the guild that, that I've never looked into in one of the books. And I've been meaning to for a while, but of course, I've mostly been focusing on monsters, so I don't really yeah. know. Yeah. <laughs> so, Rory, R- R- so you... You know, like, so you got the, the guild masters, you've got the guild managers, which sort of act as like a small proxy for the guild when it's like a smaller region that's not huge. Um, and those are traditionally in the game, they're, they're done by Wyvarians because Wyvarians live much longer than humans. As such, they're seen as like, they're kind of like the, the I want to say the, I'm not going to, I'm not even going to try to say because I don't want to be offensive because I'm trying to think of a parallel in the human world and I can't think of a good one, but oh, they're kind of like... They're kind of like the natives of the the land, and they're a little bit more in touch with nature and respect the monsters more. And I think they have a more analytical, calm demeanor. So I think they're they're really well suited because they live long and they have so much more knowledge. They they're really well suited for those roles where they oversee the guild. Um, but like the guild knights, which is like they're like all I can think of is like Mass Effect when you've got like the specters. You know, it's like it's their special little group of like hunters that 
are you know taking care of like you know the really important investigations like Gormagala and stuff like that and uh, so the guild knights good old what the ace honors you know ace could the yeah. ace gunner ain't sponsor uh, and yeah <laughs> those are guild knights yeah and then i think the cat i think the cat from pokey village is also a guild knight if i'm not mistaken but i could be wrong yep philly philly colt is one <laughs> palicos can be guild knights as well yep well i don't know if he would be considered a palico because i don't think he belongs to a specific hunter but mm. uh Felines can be guild knights. Yeah. Felines can be guild knights. Interesting. And you actually, get the reception. Actually, thinking about the Palico and Monster Hunter 4, Monster Hunter 4 Ultimate was actually a guild knight too, since he was originally yeah. a part of the Ace Hunters. Yeah, exactly. He was one of their, he was what they call the Ace Palico, right? Yep. So he's technically a guild knight that you inherit, so to say, in Monster Hunter 4 for Ultimate. And that's why he kicks so much ass. <laughs> Yeah. Yep. <laughs> he was. He was. So. So that was the palico that we had, right? So he was the one that would get the powers from the other palicos, if I remember correctly. You get like three healing palicos and like two support palicos or whatever, and then you'd get like <laughs> healing and uh, poison removal and a bunch of stuff. If I remember correctly, at least I think that's the setup. I I used to run something with three healing palicos and two of the other ones. That was the the way mm. that I was running. <laughs> But and I yeah, think one good thing to call right. out, yeah, well, one good thing to call out here is that the guild receptionist, I know we call them like guild sweethearts or waifu or, and there's lots of other names we <laughs> give them, but, <laughs> but it's actually a, in the lore of the world, like becoming a guild reception is like a hardcore, like it, you've got to be pretty studious. Like they've got like, they've got to know history, geology, um, all sorts of you know science and stuff like that so like they're they're actually have to be pretty smart in order to become a guild receptionist so they're they're like the ones that are in charge of giving us quests dealing out the quests from the guild and reporting back findings and research and documenting everything so i got to give a call out to the guild sweethearts for actually being much more i think active in the world of monster hunter than the hunter is the hunter is just like you know beefcakes like go out there hunt that monster <laughs> <laughs> You know, like a, a brain dead hunter. It's like the only problem with the, the current handler is that she basically eats everything she finds. She's just like, well, <laughs> I got I got to figure out what this thing tastes like. I got to figure out if we're going to put this on the menu or not. Chomp. <laughs> she's actually she's actually documenting all that stuff for um for her own research. That's the interesting part that was mentioned in one of the most recent books. So she's doing like special a special kind of research, our handler? Yep. She's basically finding all the edibles in the new world. She's basically making a catalog of all that stuff. Yeah. That's why she's eating. She's like, this one tastes salty. This one tastes sweet. This one tasted like ass. <laughs> <laughs> pretty much. That's pretty much what she's been doing as a side thing besides, well, being our handler. That's cool. That's cool. All those it's little... so funny. You know what? I, I don't mean to sidetrack, but it's really funny. I have to mention that I know there's a lot of people who hate the handler, and it's not actually an English issue because I'm playing through Monster in the World with Yuna, my daughter. She hates the handler. I love the handler. <laughs> you, you're all well, she wrong. hates her for her role. She, she likes the character. She can't stand her role in the story because she can sound. There's something she does in Japanese that they don't have in English, which really ticked my daughter off because she's at that age where you say the wrong thing and it sets her off. And like, I think it was before Zenojiva, she's like, are you really going to go? But it was like, you know, talking down to somebody like, like, are you out of your mind? You idiot. You can't handle this. And she says it to her and Yuna got so upset. She's like, <laughs> who is this woman? <laughs> she's going to talk to me like that. <laughs> it's something like really condescending and just like, <laughs> Yikes. She's like, you're just you're the one getting us in trouble all the time. Shut up. And I'm like, oh wow. This she's she sounds like the Western community as well and at whole at whole. I still think that my hypothetical ending for world would have been a lot better. So, so you guys want you guys want to hear this? This was an idea that I had. And then it was kind of like a little bit refined by my, my stream chat. But the idea here was, you know, when Xenojiva throws his first like friggin' um Bursts of lightning, not lightning, there's like Kamehameha's, right? So imagine yep. that with one of those, 
He would drop like a rock on top of our supply box in the camp before Zinojiva. And the handler is there. She's like getting ready to, you know, to make a meal or something. And then the thing crashes and she just screams like, that was all our food. And then she would grab like a heavy bow gun, run into the fight and go like, ah, like Wyvern Oh my God. Wouldn't that have been a way cooler ending than what we got? <laughs> the handler just nobody messes in with there. my sausages. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> that, would been, that would be beyond amazing. <laughs> yeah, okay. I think, I, I, I think got, I, there's, been... there's. I'm gonna break us off on another tangent here on the reception. Go for it, and this dude. is to both of you guys. So we'll start with Dino, and then I want to hear from you, Rory. Who is your favorite guild receptionist, and why? I probably got to go with Becky. I like the idea that she's secretly a guild knight, and that, and that's always been a pretty cool aspect. It's essentially like she's a secret agent, keeping a close eye on us hunters. Yeah, and I think there's a there's a game where you can get her outfit. I think it was generations where the skills are like identical to the guild knight armor. I think it was like a small little hint, like shout out to the fact that she's this crazy hunting girl. But yeah, she's like a little hello everybody when she, she's in town. <laughs> Yeah. So I can't tell you exactly why, because it's been a long time since I last played for you, but I always really liked the guild ma'am. She's called guild ma'am, right? And in, in for you, if guild I remember Marm? correctly. Guild marm. Yeah. I, I, for some reason, I, I know in my head that it's guild marm, but I'm like, guild marm doesn't make sense. So it's probably guild ma'am. But no, they do what call her it? guild marm, right? I don't know English well enough. What does marm mean? I've... <laughs> You're asking a Portuguese say, person. <laughs> like, I want to say maiden, if I mm. recall correctly, or something like that. But I, I really like, so I, I liked her. Is her name right? I liked her outfit, and you know, th- there's just something in for you about us traveling to multiple different villages, and she's always with us and on that journey. And I don't know. There's just something about the whole story of for you that I just enjoy more than pretty much any other monster like world is my favorite monster Hunter of all times but like the journey that you're taking for you with your with a little ship that then becomes an airship and then you you go to all of these villages that to me was really cool and having her around the whole time like i, I just ended up liking her more than the other one so when i remember at one point we got don't we have that outfit in in world for our handler we can dress her up like guild yeah. yeah yeah that's like a, it's not the same for some people it's not the same <laughs> Why? Why is it an insult? Like, oh my God, she, she like I just said she's my favorite, and I still don't mind seeing the the handler. Oh, it's because they hate the handler so much. Like you guys know, I have I had a a lewd emote for the handler in Monster Hunter World, and Twitch banned it. Oh wow! What? They they removed my handler lewd emote. It wasn't like explicit or anything. It's still on YouTube. Like on on my YouTube channel, that emote still works. But on Twitch, they're like, no, what we is can't the emote. It's it's just the handler like doing a face like ah like that's it that's it uh like she she eats a really uh, good apple pie and she's having like a food gasm or something yeah something like that she's drooling <laughs> a little bit too as well but you know nothing like nothing like too spicy or anything like that you're, but they're you're, like no. you're so adult damn <laughs> exactly because like i i even saw not that long ago like a friend of mine showed me a website that shows all of the emotes on twitch and there's like a million emotes right now that are active active emotes right now there are a million times worse than mine like way more suggestive and it's just like well you know the problem the person at twitch that was working on that of banning that icon is a fan of the guild marm is, (laughs) is going out and just canceling out all the handler ones (laughs) <laughs> it doesn't even have to be a fan of the guild marm just has to be one of the many people that don't like the handler world. <laughs> get rid of it i will mention this i'll mention this for those listening but because i there's some people on twitter a lot of people have not heard but the guild marm's actual name is i want dino correct me wrong it's sophia right yep sophia yeah and you see that in the end credits for the game they don't actually really talk, call her sophia in the game um but she's got a name which i think is nice and so I think most, the handler, most I think of it's the Lucifer, it's like or Lucifer. What was her name? I, <laughs> I'm joking with you guys. <laughs> I, I actually never don't recall ever seeing a name for. Her. And again, 
then again, some yeah. of that stuff is like really hidden, so I wouldn't be surprised if I had missed something. No, I haven't seen any name for the handler uh, anywhere. I don't think she's do, human, so maybe she wasn't given one at birth. <laughs> I do know that um, that a majority of the guild receptionists have a name, but of yeah. course, for the most part, we don't know that. At least in the West, mm. anyway. Yeah, like the Moga sweetheart is Aisha, I think? Yep. Ashy, yeah. or something like that. Yeah, there's... I, I, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think you've done a lot of work as well on the English Wikia, right? Like, I know Kogath has put in a lot of work, but, like, that's such a good resource for looking at stuff. Like, the amount of effort everyone puts into that is crazy. Well, I have. I put in a lot. I put in, like, since as late as 2012. That's when I joined. And I wow. put in a nice bit of work since then. But, you know, I'll be disappearing from the disappearing from the lower aspect of Monster Hunter in the coming years. Ah, yeah. so you're stepping back and uh, opening it up for the, the new bloods to come in and take the reins? That's the plan. That's one of the things that I, that I was curious, because I, I do remember a while back I saw a tweet from you saying that, like, I think it was when Sixth Generation came, whatever, you were like, okay, that's it. When Sixth Generation hits, I'm done doing lore stuff in World. Is there any particular reason? I've, I've been curious about that, actually. As much, I do love doing the lore stuff for Monster Hunter, but that crap is really taxing on my mind, and I want to do other things besides that, because even though I love Monster and I will continue loving it for all my life, chances are, chances are, I, chances are, well, what's, what's the word to use for it? Chances are I might either lose interest in it eventually or, what was it? Oh, I want to do other things in my life besides the lore stuff for yeah. Monster Hunter. <laughs> yeah, you don't want to become like pig, pigeonhole, like, you know, this is the Monster Hunter lore guy and that's all you do. And, is you're capable of so much more. You kind of want to, you know, stop letting that define everything that you do. Oh, yeah, I, I, yeah. I, let me tell you, I have a lot of experience being pigeonholed. Like when I started making YouTube videos, I was the World of Warcraft tank guy. Then I started <laughs> uh, shifting towards Dark Souls. I was the Dark Souls guy. Now I'm another one of the Monster Hunter guys. And it's like YouTube keeps pigeonholing you. Okay, now, now you do Monster Hunter. And I'm like, I want to do something else. And YouTube's like, shut up. Do more Monster Hunter. <laughs> that's, that's how it works. <laughs> so so Di Dino is going to move back so that you can take the reins of running the lore. In the, in the oh, weekend, so. you, me, I'm yes, me. I'm, I'm, I'm very good at lore. <laughs> like, <laughs> You're young. You can do it. <laughs> oh, yes, yes. Like, you, sh you should have seen the, the recaps of episodes that we did in uh, the Divinity Original Sin playthrough that I did with Pally Time. It was like, hey, what did we do last episode? I'm like, yeah things we killed some people <laughs> okay. so I guess before we pivot away from the guild uh, there's something i wanted to talk about which i like um which is the hunter's guild symbol like the crest that they have it's like the the four quadrant kind of like uh icon that they have I think oh it's called no hunter's i guild. the <laughs> crest or emblem yeah. yeah but it's nice because there's like four different things that they're representing that the guild represents and like one of them is like you know respect for nature uh, people living together as a community, um, using the stuff that you get from nature to craft stuff and, you know, prosperity. And so it's yeah. kind of like it's its own little religion almost. It's its nice. I like it. Yeah, it displays, it displays how much the guild holds, holds, holds a high stance for nature. Very so different I'm, from the ancients. If I don't know if, if you guys even want to talk about the whole ancient thing. But. Yes. Tell, tell me more. Like, I want to know everything. What, what 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 are the ancients like what what is the ancients like this this is related to the pyramid that we see in the flooded forest right they, is it some somewhat at least in my more recent things i've been looking through with the ancients it's like that's what i'm gonna describe it's like it's like there's multiple different ancient civilizations ones with each of all of them having their seemingly with their own beliefs like in the ruined pinnacle for example all those ruins there that were from an ancient civilization that once lived there and they actually praised Velstrax. Interesting. It's a god. It's a jet engine. Well, I mean, <laughs> must have seemed very divine to them. Yeah, because something about them just something about them just looks like 
just looks so godly, especially when with him sitting at the top of that pinnacle, which mm. in the past was actually <laughs> a lot smaller. It was actually a lot was actually a lot smaller to a point where the people could actually see those tracks in up in the sky. Oh wow. But but as time went on due to due to the dragon energy there, the mountain continuously grew to that enormous size. So the mountain dragon energy actually, is so mysterious. So the mountain actually grew? Like that's so freaking crazy. It's 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 Dude, always funny. Go, somehow go ahead. Somehow, due to the dragon energy, the mountain eventually grew over time. I don't know how to explain it any other way, but since, well, you know, the dragon was like a mystery in itself. Yeah. Yeah, like, isn't there, the, say... the, isn't there something that, that says that, like, supposedly dragon damage deals more damage to monsters that are, like, smarter than the other monsters? Isn't there something about That's... that? It's eh, maybe I've been trying to look to find where that was originally said, but I've never found anything for it. So mm, hard to say. <laughs> <That's> yeah, if, <laughs> if you don't mind, I, I want to lay a little bit of framework here, just because I know I've I've touched, I've wrestled some feathers of some people when it comes to the ancients and this topic in particular. But I would say that well, here we go. The whole point of the whole the whole point of the ancients, for those who don't know, is that there's just a there's kind of like um. There's like a background, it's not a story, it's like a background theme in the world of Monster Hunter, where, you know, Monster Hunter itself feels almost, a, you know, like almost rural, right? You got villages and hunters and things are kind of like, it's not like advanced civilization. It's kind of, you know, like, it's kind of rustic, right? Where there's this underlying theme that humans used to be pretty bad. Like during the, there was an ancient civilization way back when, who knows, like could have been a million years ago, could have been a thousand years ago, who knows? And it seems like the humans got, you know, it's a common theme that we see in movies, right? Like humans got greedy with power. They started disrespecting nature. And so, you know, mother nature decided to fight back. So there was, um, there was beef between the dragons and the people. And, you know, we know that they did stuff like the dragon energy and, you know, a lot of the old weapons that you find, uh, whether it be relics or whatever, they, they tend to have dragon element. Because the ancients had, you know, technologies that we don't have today. So it's like the old idea of like, I guess almost like Horizon Zero Dawn. Like some old civilization had a whole bunch of like mysterious, cool, you know, mystic crap going on uh, with technology. They got wiped out for some whatever reason. And now here we are today, but we still have remnants of whatever was there long, long ago. So there's it, most of it's like headcanon at best. Like there's no hard. The game never comes out and says this is what happened. It just gives you hints at what may have happened. It's just an underlying theme and tone in the game. So I get kind of frazzled when I see people talk about stuff like, you know, this, uh, like the history of, you know, Fatalis and like what actually went down. And the point is the game doesn't define it. It gives us hints at what may have happened, but it doesn't actually define it. So whatever you want to believe is fine. Um, but don't, there's no hard lore, like dark souls, like, this is what happened, you know, and you can find you think, this out. Right? You think there's hard lore in Dark Souls? <laughs> <laughs> well, hard enough, I think. A lot of a lot of the stuff in Dark Souls is actually intentionally uh, left to the player's interpretation. So there, there's actually, you know, most people accept what Vadi says, and a lot of the stuff that he says is, you know, the intended thing of the developers. But it is yeah. left. There's a lot of blanks that people can fill. Uh, with their own imagination. Yeah, I love that he seem... always mentions that. He, I love how he always says, you know, this is just one way that we're interpreting all the stuff that we have. This yeah. may not actually be the case. And uh, but, I, I um, kinda, Dino, kinda is there anything like... you want to add about the ancients? Or Oh, sorry. Let me see. Oh, There's yeah. one thing that I still want to add. <laughs> but go, oh, go for it. Do have, ancients do have seemingly they have sketches for many old weapons that some some are more advanced than others and they seem to have a lot of text for some monsters that have never been identified by the guild. Like mm. in Four Ultimate, for example, in one of the um, in one of the texts that you decipher when you make it to G rank is you actually finally discover Raging Brachidios through those through those old documents left behind by the ancients. Man. 
Yeah, they got all sorts of weird so, stuff left behind. So Ra- was Raging Brachidios not in that game? Oh, he was. He that was, was his debut. It's, he was. It's just that that monster was never known to the Gale before until, until they actually found those um, ancient texts oh, okay. slash documents on that, on that subject. Interesting. So, I mean, I have to bring this one up, even if just uh, for us to correct... Gaijin, <laughs> you guys can't see it in the video, but I'm looking at Gaijin who's already face palming in his camera. Uh, but but just because like I know that I've brought it up in previous videos, so this is almost like uh, me redeeming myself because at the time I had no idea. I just thought this was a really cool thing, so I always like bringing that up whenever people are talking about. Oh man, do you, have you ever seen anything about the lore of Monster? And I was like, man, let me tell you guys about the equal dragon weapon. <laughs> Um, Dino, me, give us your thoughts. Let me see. <laughs> honestly, E-D- E-D- E-D-W. honestly, I'm not. I'm not completely against it, and I'm like fifty fifty on it. It's like for me at this point, it's like Capcom can do whatever they want with that idea if they ever want to expand on it. If they do expand on it. I do hope they give some. I do hope they further explain it, like in greater, greater detail, as well as the ancient civilization. But if they don't, I can't even be angry about it. But do you? So, I, I mean, I mean, for starters, I think that for the people that don't know what the equal dragon weapon is, can you can you explain it to us a little bit? It's basically a bioorganic weapon that combines. It can size mach- machines with the parts of dragons to create something, something that's unholy that's said to be like something that breaks the balance of, nat- of nature itself. <laughs> that's the best way to describe it. Yeah. I mean, it's basically Frankenstein's monster, right? So, like, this is some, I'm, I stop it's, me if I'm going off on a tangent here, but like, I I made a video on this and it it pissed off a lot of people for some reason, but like. It, Monster Hunter, before they started the first game, was set to be a medieval fantasy RPG game. It was supposed to have wizards and magic and sorcery, elves, orcs, all sorts of crap, right? And of course, like during as they're doing pre-production, they're coming up with ideas. They eventually started skewing more towards like what we would call realistic, which is like what we see today, right? With like roasting your meat, you know, and like fishing and going out and hunting wyverns and stuff like that. And I think that's great, but. They have lots of really cool concept art and ideas of exploration of inspirational pieces. And a lot of that actually got used for the bedrock of like the ancient civilization, but they moved away from this whole fantasy thing. But like when they were doing their, their sort of world building exploration, they had some cool concept pieces, right? They had like crypt serpents and they had this, you know, one piece of art, which they drew, which was the equal dragon weapon. And they said, you know, can you imagine the humans were killing dragons using their corpses to create their own super giant dragon. It's almost like Nausicaa or whatever, like the Ghibli film, like, you know, breaking the rules of nature, making Frankenstein's monster made out of the corpses of a hundred wyverns. And it would be as powerful as, you know, everything in the world and the humans would take over. And, and then, you know, Fatalis got pissed off and nature decided to wipe them all out. And the rest is history. And there was a great war between the dragons and the humans. It's like none of this became lore. It was just explorative background stuff that they were playing with. And but people saw that that picture, which is pretty neat. They saw the picture in like an old there's a part of like the encyclopedias in Japan that in the illustration books, which just showed off some of the cool, you know, conceptual art that they had way back when when they were making the first game. And it was just one of them. And then it's such a dumb name, equal dragon weapon, because it's equal strength to that of a dragon it's like it's it's not even proper english i I think it was supposed to be like 10 times stronger than dragons no isn't it something like that right i know maybe it's like it's like the more blood the more blood that it got from its enemy the stronger and the stronger it got and the longer it could live as it fought So yeah, so I mean, needless to say, the Monster Hunter we know today, who knows what happened during the ancient civilization. For all we know, there was hunters from Mars and Venus and, you know, Jupiter, and there was laser bolts. I mean, we have no idea, right? The whole but, point is that there's a civilization that's left behind. So it's not canon. It's, it's, it was But, but here's really the old. thing. Is it, is it officially not canon or is it kind of like, 
you know, some well, people the, the, think, it's, it's think it is left in the air. It's left in the air. It's not canon, but it's also not defined as not canon. You know what I'm saying? Like they, they have it as an old conceptual piece, but they never said, <laughs> no, we scrapped this idea. It doesn't exist. Like they so don't wait, even touch it. The whole point is so to listen, not touch it. So listen, you remember that scene from Dumb and Dumber? Where Jim Carrey goes and says, so you're saying there's a chance. There's a chance. Exactly. <laughs> there is. I would say there is. For the fact that they're not going to go through their old concepts and say, oh, this is a scrapped idea. We This never happened. Like, why would they even do that? That's just Excuse dumb. Me. But there's nothing in the game that suggests that, like, this actually happened. Like, this is just concept art in the book from, like, way back. I mean, there's other concept art of, like, you know, sorcerer hunters. Are you going to tell me that that happened? I mean, maybe, maybe in the old ancient times there was sorcerers. Who knows? Hey. Did, you, did you know that the the palicos were originally like goblins, right? I mean, we. I mean, we got the Gaja Laka and Shaka Laka for that. So, dude, yeah. the Gaja Lakas. We've Gajalaka. seen their real face, and they do kind of give that goblin-like appearance. But yeah. that's about it. Wait, you've seen their real face? I haven't seen that. <laughs> what the hell? That's that's I'm, not that's like people editing the the files, right? That's not actually in the game. They're actually, like, they actually have legit art of it in one of the more recent books. Yeah, but uh, yeah, the, it, it's just I see all these really great concept arts from the, the time and period when it was more of a fantasy game, and I, I love that they didn't just throw away the idea. They kept hints of all that work in the, in this idea of the ancients. So they have little hints of something mystic in the past. But we live in a world of, as hunters that's more grounded in reality. I know that sounds so stupid because, <laughs> come on, reality, monster hunter. You know what I'm trying to say, though, right? Let me just, uh, let me just the dragons pick up. That so much. <laughs> let me just grab my, my, sh- my gun lance. <laughs> <laughs> Let me Beat jump must- off on a mountain and just land on my feet, and I'm totally fine. Let me grab my, my charge blade that shoots lightning. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's all I want to say on the equal dragon weapon and the ancients is that none of it's been... The whole point is that nothing is clear. They're not going to ever... That so, I know of. They're not go- the, the point is not to go through and say what actually happened. It's up to your imagination. So, yeah, there's so a chance. Like a, good, a good parallel is like the Mayan civilization. Basically. They had a lot of stuff. They knew a lot of stuff that we didn't. They had a lot of technology they weren't supposed to have. Nobody knows how they had it. The world's going to end in 2020 because the Mayan calendar says no. (laughs) More like the equal dragon weapon's going to come down and it was more like the the Mayans that were in charge of like doing calendars. They were just like, "Look, dude, we don't have to plan more than 2020, dude." They're (laughs) just like, "We got plenty of time to to get on this when we get there." Plenty of time and plenty of toilet paper. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the Mayans didn't have that problem. I guess they, they might have actually been more advanced than we were in regards to toilet paper. So, so Dino, there's something I want to ask. I'm going to pivot here, if it's okay. Um, so I think we've covered, like, that's the Hunter's Guild, right? And they've got the organization yeah. and... They exist everywhere, and now you've got like your your first fleets and all them in the new world or whatever. But there's like a few other societies which I really like that are not technically part of the Hunters Guild, as far as I'm aware, but they exist. So like they made up this this uh, what was it the Royal Paleontology Scriveners? It's an organization yeah. of like um, documenters and who take down notes and lore and document like elder dragons and stuff like that. Um, yeah. Do you do you know a lot about them or? I I know a tiny bit more about them than the guild. They're they're basically like a lot of them like they're various researchers and they're one of the few NPCs. They're one of the few NPCs in the series that actually have oh well, legit names. Like hmm. let me think of one. For I was going to ask if your name is inspired by one of them or not because there's Darren Dino or Darren Dino. I was kind of curious if Dino is where you got that from or not. I actually didn't actually. <laughs> It's actually just a gamer tag I go by that I randomly came up with. <laughs> but yeah, we yeah. got John Arthur, Gustav Ron, and Darren Dino, Sir Banus. Like, there's actual, like, they're very Western names for the, yeah. the paleontologies. Yeah. John Arthur was like one of, the, is one of the more interesting ones to me because, well, it's implied 
he he disappeared a long time ago, but at least in the second generation, it was implied that he might very well still be alive somewhere in the world, just lost somewhere. And some people even speculated before Iceborne came out that um that um the tracker's master might have actually been him and he might have been the one that was lost that was lost at sea during the events of um during the events before and during Iceborne. Oh, interesting. So, Rory, is the Royal Paleontology Scrivener's news to you? Are you aware of these, this group or no? I have no nope. idea what, what you're talking about. <laughs> so, one of the things I like, though, is that because Capcom, at least the team at Monster Hunter, didn't, they don't just half-ass it, right? They always try to come up with some type of world-building explanation for everything that they do. That when they have the encyclopedias and they have like all these entries about the Elder Dragons and stuff like that, they're all written from the perspective of a fictional character. So you get all these like articles written from John Arthur or from Gustav or these other like Scriveners who like documented what they saw or heard or something. I love that. They even they even do that with the concept art for some of the monsters. Some of them like being like some quote unquote some quote unquote monsters that they might have that they might have seen or some people reported seeing but were never well officially confirmed or not. Yeah, this reminds me of like, you know, Game of Thrones. You've got like that like weird library and you're like it's it's its own little society of people who research and document stuff. It's it's kinda like that. They're not part of a political wing, although they do share their information with the guild, of course. It's just like their job is to document history and, and nature and stuff. I, I like that a lot. The yeah. guild also oh, I'm sorry, go. And one funny thing was, well, I actually learned about this this weekend, but the Royal Paleontology Scriveners, they were the ones that actually gave Legaya Chris its name, not the Geld, which honestly oh. surprised me. <laughs> wow, interesting. That's I did cool. not know that. So <laughs> the, the Guild also um, sometimes has a lot of information that they keep for themselves. Like they they're not particularly forthcoming with stuff like you see examples of that, for instance, in the Fatalis quest where it's like, Oh, some big shot from the guilds coming over. And like, they don't give you all of the information in regards to Fatalis and stuff like that. Uh, like, do you know what, why does the guild sometimes almost seems like they're the friggin' CIA of monster hunter world or something <laughs> like that? Like with how secretive they are. They don't want the um, public to panic about some of that stuff, which is the reason why they sometimes withhold information about that kind of stuff. That and sometimes they don't really know what a monster is capable of, like Gormagala, for example. So they don't want to start any kind of panic or any trouble with people, with the general public, without knowing full well what a monster is fully capable of, like an elder dragon. So, yeah, I don't think we've ever gotten hints of like corruption or anything like that within the guild. I think it's more just that they they try to keep order uh, in the land, so to say, in a, in a good sense of the word. And that came out really wrong. I love I love how I mentioned the CIA, and the first thing that comes to your mind is like, yeah, but they're not corrupt though. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, they're kind of like the CIA of Mossad. They're like, yeah, but no corruption. <laughs> I'm not inferring that. I'm just saying, like, <laughs> real world organizations that withhold information, there's generally they, there's strategic reasons. I don't think that's the case with the guild. I think they're just more, um, I don't know, uh, thorough What's, in what they're doing. What are some of, like, the, the monsters that you think the guild considers to be, like, the most dangerous ones? Like, say, the, the deepest, darkest archives of the guild that very few people would have access to? Elatrion, Fatalis... Mm, basically, really, any older dragon, a cantor, Eucanalos, Matsu, Alamador, and that's really about it. Yeah, so I mean, the black dragons for sure is like the big thing, right? But, but basically, I pretty mean, much like you said about every older dragon in the series. Yeah, but it's not like the guild is like perfectly capable of knowing everything about the elders because there's another organization in the world which I don't think is also officially part of the guild which is the, the elder dragon, dragon observation team the dragon seers yeah that's the little balloons you see in the air i think that's dragon seer balloons right yep <laughs> they try to keep an eye on the movements of older dragons and try to predict their movements kind of like you know a weather like a weather channel for example 
Yeah. Because the whole idea of Elder Dragon is that they're they are li- like living <clears throat> living catastrophes, right? Like Amatsu moves and you might get your entire town flooded and destroyed by the storms. So they try to keep tabs on the Elder Dragons and figure out what's going on in the world, right? Yeah. That, and if you wave hi to them, they'll tell you where the monsters are. <laughs> yeah, not many people know that. Yeah, that that's actually that's actually funny because I, I, despite the fact that I didn't play the old games that much, I knew that one. I knew that you could like wave and oh, the balloon guy, tell me where the monster is. <laughs> <laughs> and I think the only other organization that I have, I just put a, a little notes this morning, just trying to rethink of stuff. The only other organization that I know of in the world of Monster Hunter is the Y Academy, but I they're kind of like the unofficial guilds hunters guild up in Berna. Like they have their own thing going on, but they're they yeah. act pretty much like the Hunters Guild. Yeah, and they um and they work closely at the Royal Paleontology Scrubineers, at least from what I remember. Yeah, because yeah, they're they're mostly scholars and stuff, like even the guy that's up in the Soratorium, like total scholar dude. The weapons that you get to craft from them, like I remember that I wanted to craft a gun lens and it was a friggin' pen and a book. I'm just like, well, what is mm. <laughs> what am I supposed to do with this? <laughs> it's a pen. <laughs> like, I know the pen is mightier than the sword, but yeah, I, I don't know about that. <laughs> as long as a as long as it's a big pointy pen, it should work. <laughs> so um, let's let's move into the villages, I guess. So uh, like we have Koto Village. You have any background, nah. like in particular for that? Because because that one that one is like the very first Monster Hunter mm. game. All the way up yeah, in PlayStation Dino, uh, Take 2. this one away. I'd love to hear your, your thoughts on the lore and monsters of Kokoto Village. Hmm. Well, one of the things, I think one of the most important things for Kokoto Village is, well, the hero of Kokoto is Chief. The, yeah. He is well known for having to defeat Mon- Monopolos. Monopolos. <laughs> and he, used, wow. he was able to defeat it and, well, cut off its horn. He was known for that legendary hunt that took presumably days, if I remember correctly. Yeah, he's he. They say he's legendary, but like I can kill a monoblos in fifteen minutes. It took him like three days to do it. But then again, yeah. he was using like a really shitty weapon, though, right? He had yeah. like he, he had like green sharpness. That's not fair. <laughs> it was a G and, rank one or something from Frontier, you know. Was... And then there's the five incident where his um. Where his fiance yeah. was killed during a during a hunt for a louse and lung. Yeah, which, I think we talked about this on the podcast, didn't we, Yuri? I I don't know. The is that no. the rule of four? Yeah. Yes. Oh, it's, so it wasn't in, in the first Moss Hunter is when they came up with the rule of four. Yeah, <laughs> that's that's real. But but take us through it, please. Please take us through it. Basically, there was like, basically the rule. Basically, anything more than 400s, unless it's like a really special occasion, like something like a gen, for example, which sometimes people, which even though it's not shown in game, up to 16 people actually hunt for lo- for gen Moran. But, but for the most part, five or anything more than that is seen as a taboo number, and it actually is seen as just bad luck. So because of that incident where the... Where the where Kokoda's chief brought more than more than four hunters, the fifth being his wife, she died during that loss and lung hunt, and it was basically seen as well. Any was seen as a bad luck number, and well, the girls enforced that law, and essentially, at least from from what I remember. Yeah, there so like go, the guys. whole Kokoda village and that whole area is like the the base of a lot of the old world lore. So the stories from that village have a huge effect on the guild and just the world in general. And that so little Wyvarian dude being a legendary hunter, I find really funny. So, so basically they're kind of like, the, you, you would almost say that they're like the first major place where the guild operated would have been Kokoto village, like from a lore standpoint. Cause you, cause you're saying like a lot of the rules kind of come from there. Yeah. I don't, I don't know if I would like call it, operated or anything because i know they're they're situated in dundorma which is quite a ways away from kokota village but it's kind of like one of the og villages and it's one of the og hunters right is is the elder there so i actually am curious how old he really is then again only real implication we have is well well you know what happened to scrad or i mean shred shred 
Yeah, I'd guess he's at least he's probably several hundred years old. I would guess. Yeah, which they just left so long. It's complicated. I know. I was like, <laughs> I want to know how old is Hinoa and Minoto? Like, they look like they're in their twenties. They're probably like eighty years old or ninety years old. Uh, that someone I, someone on Twitter already made that because they were like, oh man. Look! Look at look at the 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 new handmaidens. Like he was he was being all horny about it, and then he made like a meme, like "Oh, she's seventeen years old." And then it's like, but convert he converted it to like Wyvarian years. She's like a hundred something or whatever. I, I it's don't that know. wife who it's like it, what's the word for gr- like hot grandma or something, right? It's like <laughs> elf. elf. Oh no! <laughs> oh man! What but yeah, you do? Don't Kobato Google that. Is, is neat. <laughs> They had the whole like hero's blade in the in the stone like hero and it, like I just I like Kokota Village a lot personally. It's so, and even though I didn't start I didn't start back then. So what I'm curious is like uh, at what point do Wyvarians just kind of like shrivel down and become like the blacksmith from Monster Hunter Tri? How does that work? Because like the blacksmith from Tri is a Wyvarian, down. right? Yeah, because like you, you for instance you look at World right and you got Wyvarians there or you look at even Inoa and Minoto, like right, they look like perfectly normal uh, females, right? But then you look at the blacksmith from Monster Hunter Tri. It looks like a friggin' goblin. He's like tiny. From my understanding, kind of like humans, there's actually different. There's actually different races of way variants, believe it or not. So oh. there's some ethnic differences between them. Yeah. So they're dwarven wyvarians. I thought that they just shriveled down after a certain age. The thing is, wasn't the wasn't the man? Did he didn't he technically come from Cathar, or am I misunderstanding? I believe he did come from Cathar. That is said to be the birthplace of well, most wyvarians. So yeah, but I like Maybe. what you mentioned. There's there's different like like different ethnic ethnicities within wyvarians because I mean they're a wide race as well. So. Lots of different types. Oh, dude, I want to be a dwarven wyvarian. Like a small you, wyvarian, you, dude. Like a big you can be stocky. Called the man. <laughs> but <laughs> as far as their as far as the wyvarians ages go, we we really don't know how old they can be, but the oldest known wyvarian from what I can recall is Trisha. He's estimated to be about 350 plus years old. Mm. Where so, what game is he on? He's he's in he he first appeared in Monster Hunter Freedom Two and then Monster Hunter Freedom Unite and he also appears in Generations and Generations Ultimate. And his immenseness from For You, he must be old as hell as well. Yeah, because <laughs> like you were saying, Dwarven Wyvarians, that guy is a giant Wyvarian. Like he's he's literally a giant. That's a huge guy that sits on inside the gathering hall for Monster Hunter for Ultimate. That's that's the interest. That's the interesting thing about them. It's like giant wave variants. They're a rarity. It's like they appear like every few thousand, like one appears every few thousand years. Yeah. So I guess he deserves the name. His immenseness. <laughs> his immenseness. <laughs> it's such a great word. That is so weird. Um. So what? So what are like other monsters of note from the um the very first Monster Hunter? Like ones with cool lore. Like we talk about a little bit about Lao Shen Lung, uh, but Lao Shen Lung, Lao Shen Lung, the reason we kind of have to fight him, at least I've heard rumors of this, is that is because of Fatalis, right? That's correct. Eisborn even confirmed that. Yes, he's running like a bitch. He's like, no! <laughs> it's like, the hills. it's like every single monster fears Fatalis to a point where. When Fatalis becomes active, they all just flee. Yeah, nope. <laughs> They're like, I'm out of here. <laughs> Even the last trans be- like, screw the old world. I'm going to the new world, man. I'm out of here. <laughs> Which kind of just shows off how powerful Fatalis is. And it's crazy just to imagine that. And we're not even talking about crimson or white. Oh, yeah, man. Imagine when Grandpa White Fatty comes down. Everyone must be like, run underground or something. So... Tell us about the origins of Fatalis a little bit. Because like I, I have some notion of the origins of Fatalis, but there's probably a lot of people that are tuning in for the lore. They're like, okay, so well, how did it all get started? What happened with Shrad or Sh- Shrade? I, I have to say Shrade because I always say Shrad for some reason. I mean, not much is really known. All we know is that 
about a thousand years ago, Italis descended on on Shred, and basically, oh, it turned that place into its own personal nest, and it didn't leave any survivors, at least as far as we know. But this interesting thing was. Around around the time that Fatales appeared, at least a couple of months before it appeared, a person with a mysterious person in a red cloak appeared in front of the king. And he actually seemingly he kind of was like a force he kind of foretold or was like an omen for Fatalis's coming. Is that this is that the scarlet um clothed man? The scarlet robed yep. man? Yep, that's um son, son of a son of a bitch. I bet you it's Diozo who's underneath the the scar the garms. <laughs> but Freaky thing is, he appeared a thousand years ago. Yet in game, we still get quests from him to this very day. Exactly. Which, yeah, it's some dragon's dogma shit going on. I like to think that maybe he might be a Wavarian in disguise, but who knows? I don't know. It's it's a running thing, uh, Ruri. I don't know if you know about. There's a, the Scarlet Road Man. He his quests appear in like every game. There's some like when it's like some like really crazy end game event quest against an elder dragon. If you look at who gave you the quest, sometimes it's the Scarlet Road Man, and he's like really, he's quite a character, even though he's text only, and we which, don't actually um, know who the hell he is. W- which one of the quests in World was by the, the Scarlet uh, Road Man? Is there one from World? Maybe he took a step out of the World, because it's the New World, I don't know. There actually, there actually isn't one. There isn't. See, it's not officially canon anymore. World is now deconfirmed. It's no longer Monster Hunter 5 guy. Damn it. What about, okay, so <laughs> Gen Yu. One of the major quests in Gen U. Yeah, I have notes here somewhere about this. Ah, <laughs> don't worry about it. Yeah, that. I don't want to. Go, I don't want to go was, through. But I was just curious because oh, I wanted go. to so, see like what what quests I would have done potentially that were uh, handed by this man. I, I was okay, actually here. We go. I have a small list. I actually was going to make a video on this one time, and I I, I ended up not doing it. Um, so in Monster Hunter Generations, he had a quest against an Alatrian called Where Gods Fear to Trend. And it's so funny because he's always testing the hunters, like, can you handle it? Huh? Huh? And he's like almost enjoying it. So the Scarlet Mystery Man is what he's called. He says, like, long time no see, hunters. I prepared a test for you all. You know, this day your opponent is Alatrian. Who's going to emerge victorious in battle? You or the beast feared by heavens themselves? Um, I was... For you... He- he was Crimson Fatalis quest. He had two that he gave. And then he also gave the, he's the one who gave the Fatalis quest. Um, for ultimate, he's the one who gave the, there was a, do you remember the super quest? It was like an event quest, but the monster was like insanely powerful. Sort of like the super Bracky and super ivory Lager Cruise from 3U. There was a super yeah. Delamadur. So the Delamadur was like super, like one shot your ass. Like it was a really powerful one. It's called Pillar of Strength of the quest. And he's the one who gives the trial to the hunter. He's the one who issues it. Um, the Monster Hunter 4, he's the one who gave uh, the Gold Rathian and Silver Rathalos quest. In 3, G- 3 Ultimate, he gave the Alatrion G-Rank quest. Um, then in Monster Hunter Portable 3rd, he also gave Gold and Silver Rathalos quest, as well as the Super Amatsu quest and Alatrion. He even <laughs> appeared um, in Monster Hunter Freedom Unite uh, with the final invitation with the double Rajan quest that everyone fears. Um, that was him as well. <laughs> so yeah, Damn. he's he's been around for a long time giving crazy ass quests. And what one thing that was really interesting, and you guys I it's funny I even mentioned this because I hate data mining and it's something that I've always hated. But there was someone who data minded Monster Hunter G, like the original like PlayStation 2 game, like way back when. And there was an item that you couldn't get in the game that was still in the data. Um called uh it was it was called the guildmaster earring and the description says an earring given by a founding father of the guild by the mysterious scarlet man so they were hinting that the the mysterious scarlet man was involved with the creation of the guild itself so i think it's tsujimoto i i have to assume it's a joke at this point but there's no hint whatsoever of who this character is ha huh. i actually didn't know that <laughs> damn yes <I'm- laughs> That's crazy. <laughs> I was hoping that world, you know, with Fatalis and the we saw the Guild General. Like I was hoping they would. Oh, is this the Scarlet Mystery Man? Like what's going on? But nope, there was. They never even touched the subject. So I was kind of like, ah, just is, more mystery. I was I was actually wondering when you guys started talking about this, this Scarlet Man. I was wondering if that was 
he could have been a fatalis himself because there's that whole thing about if a hunter there's wears a rumor like that yeah fatalis that's, armor long enough <clears throat> that's that's a rumor which we don't know which i do wonder if they yeah. might actually explain that in the ice war book or not yeah i just i think it'd be funny for a fatalis to give a fatalis quest right then again it is kind of like egging down the hunters to try it out it's like let's see if you can do it ha 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 <laughs> yeah, exactly. Because ultimately, he just wants to kill everybody and wear them as armor. Can can you can you yeah. give us some more details about the why this fatalis like wearing hunters as armor? It's more like it's more like something fatalis does by pure accident. He often sleeps on he often sleeps on the metal and other stuff of its prey, and occasionally, and from him from his body temperature being extremely hot. This, the metal melts onto his skin, making his skin much tougher than before, thus giving him that incredibly strong hide. I, th- I thought that was actually something that he did intentionally to, like, mock the hunters. <laughs> nah, they actually, they actually did confirm that, like, early last year. Interesting. Um, so, so what about the, um, the other fatalises, the, the white fatalis, crimson fatalis? Like, how does, that, um, how does that go about into existing? Crimson Fatalis, seemingly he was seemingly he was a Fatalis that was repelled by hunters and went to the volcano to to gain more power. The the lava, the the mac, I mean the meteors you see it falling from the sky, those are actually just that's actually just lava from the nearby volcano that's erupting. White Fatalis is White Fatalis is a weird one. It's like He's said to be older than any other older dragon. Like he's essentially supposed to be the ancestor of them all, including including Bla- including the other two Fatalis. So White Fatalis is pretty much like its own species, or like best way to describe like an ancestral species of Fatalis. He is the OG. Which is yeah, which is it's kind of confusing when you really think about it, but. Well, what can you do? Yeah, I mean, the whole idea behind the Black Dragons was not to really have believable lore, it's just to make them fun and cool. So I think they're a little bit loose in the way that they do both history and also just the science behind what they can actually perform. Yeah, I'm praying that that Iceborne book will explain those, will explain them better. I'm praying. When does that come out? Do you know? I don't. It's. I should, it's I should like look that up, actually. they said that um, and they Kan Kaname Fujioka was looking through it currently before they decide a date. Hmm. Let's see if I can find anything. So we got Lao Shen Lung, which is basically. I mean, Lao Shen Lung then doesn't have any like super interesting lore. He's just like a really big dude that like takes everything in front of him, and he's running from Fatalis. Like that's it. Is he even an elder dragon? Like I don't actually remember. He he is an elder dragon. The, he spends most of his time sleeping underground. Like they can spend like about, uh, they can stay underground for like a couple hundred years before eventually waking up due to well, you know, fatalis. For the most part, they for the most part they don't bother anyone, but they awaken every once in a while due to fatalis. And then they just like. Run to the hills. <laughs> yeah. So Which are there is any... that? Go ahead. The weird thing about, and the one interesting thing about Lao Shen Lung that I was forgot to mention was a lot of people think that um the Lao Shen Lungs we encounter are babies, but they're adults. Hmm. They're all just adults. Okay. To me, the the real star of that hunt is the dude that's up on the the ridge throwing down the boulders. He's the <laughs> MVP. I don't know if you noticed, but there's like a, an NPC that's actually doing that shit during the hunt. He's like up on the hill and like pushing these boulders down. It's funny. And I never paid too much attention to that. I was like, okay, get to the cannons, shoot him with the cannons, shoot him with the ballista, whatever, Dragonator time. Even though freaking freaking Chaos Slayer killed that thing in Gen U just by shelling. <laughs> just by shelling. Can you imagine the patience it takes to do that? Just like... Straight up uh, shell Lao Shan Lung to death. Like, Jesus Christ. No thing, yeah. <laughs> it would definitely so, take a long time. 
So what other monsters do you think are like the more interesting ones that we got from the OG Monster Hunter back in Kyoto Village? For, I'll have I, to say, I, I like Monoblos. Monoblos only because, oh. like you were saying, there's the legend of the village chief, right? And he took it down alone. And so there's like the tradition that in the game, Monoblos only appears in the single player village. So you have to take it down solo yourself. I like that. It's a nice shout out. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm trying to think because that's a tough one. I think I got to go with the OG, Rathalos. Yeah, <laughs> he, was, he, was the, he was the flagship, right? On, on that one? Yep. I, I, it, does he, I, I want to ask you guys' opinion on this. Everyone thinks that he's on the logo, like the, the actual like Monster Hunter logo with the, the monster on the top, but that's actually Rathian. That's not Rathalos. Yep, that is her. Uh, didn't know if you knew that. So she was actually the first monster ever created for the game. She is the true OG from development standpoint. And so she's the one on the logo that says Monster Hunter and it shows like the silhouette of what everyone thinks is Rathalos, but that's that's Rathian. I've always I've always considered both of them flex shapes just because well yeah. they're the same, same species monster, to yeah. begin with. Yeah, they're just male or female. They're they're the same monster, so, so I think people thing, tend to forget. One little thing about them is Rathalos he actually mates with multiple Rathian. And the funny part about it's it is Damn. After mating with them, the females fight over him, and only the strongest female gets to live by his side in the nest, while the others are forced to live in other areas, such as the desert. We gotta get some, we gotta get some double Rathian turf wars going on, <laughs> fighting over so, their man. So basically, that's so, that's so like high school level. Like that's crazy. Dude, dude, so basically, the ones we find in Wild Spire Waste are the rejects. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Which I always wondered that, that's why. That's a dark way of thinking about it. Sheesh. I always <laughs> wondered why they appeared in the desert to begin with. Why in some quests they said they were making a nest there. Then comes the world and they actually give an explanation as to why. So only in world is when we figured that out. The uh, book, which I was kind of surprised about when I first learned about that. That's so cool. <laughs> wow. Very interesting. Well, I mean, I I would believe everything that book says because that's. I mean, Togeda directed World, and he, that man is obsessed with Rathalos. I mean, that's the reason why he joined the company, was Rathalos. I don't know if you guys know his story. It's, it's actually an interesting one, but... <clears throat> so, like, he played Monster Hunter before it came out, the very first one. He was at Tokyo Game Show, and they had, like, a demo of it, where there were, it was still, like, really early in development. And he played it, and um, he, they had Rathalos as the hunt, because it was the only monster, apparently, that was actually running at that point. So they had a Rathalos hunt and he being like so obsessed with like animals, like amphibians, reptiles, dragons, he really, he loved it. But he also said, I could do better. Like he had in his mind, like it should be doing this. Like there was things in his head. So he became, he fell in love with the game and immediately applied to Capcom and started working there like right afterwards. He's the one who redesigned it in third generation. So he changed some of its like its footprints and everything. He added the exhaust system. And so, like, world is kind of like his grand vision of how to make the monsters more realistic and believable. So, like, that man just has an obsession with Rathalos. That is so mad respect to him, especially with like the the Rathalos turf and whatnot. Rath- <clears throat> even the very first one that you see when Rathalos picks up Anjanath and just like <clears throat> and then flames him in the face, and just like rrr, rrr, and goes away. <laughs> Poor Rathian, though she can't get a damn break. They keep picking on her, right? Like. First, she's now she's fighting other Rathian for the right to lay down with a Rathalos and getting rejected and hunted. Then she gets picked on by freaking Seregios and gets spikes chopped off. Then she tries to run away and she they, then she gets in a fight with Glavinus. Like they keep <laughs> picking on Rathian, poor thing. So well, she is the easier target, so I can't really blame them. <laughs> Look, she's on the ground. We can actually hit her. Freaking Rathalos won't sit down. I'm I'm curious how how do we go like while we're on the the Rathaloses and Rathians like what's the story behind say Azure Rathalos Silver Rathalos Dread well I, I'm not sure if Dread King that even has like a, a relevant background or not let me see with Azaru him and Pink Rathian are an interesting one because we only just now recently learned what how they come to be they basically. There are species of rattles that are developed in a nutrient-rich land, which cause their colors to change. 
that's how that subspecies came to be. Wow. I love how it's it's one of the OG subspecies, so there's like it doesn't even feel that different from the regular hunt. It's just a Rathalos that's better at fighting in the air. <laughs> Pretty much. Especially in oh god, don't even get me started about my world. That that thing's a nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> then with silver and gold, they're um they're the reason they exist is they have some kind of rare gene from their ancestors that caused them to become that color. So, and I'm guessing whatever their ancestor originally was, was extremely powerful, which could explain why their fire breeding abilities are just, just much stronger than a basic Rathalos or Rathian. So, they got good genes. Yeah. Red King, Rathian. Red King and Dread Queen, they're, they're just unknown. We don't know how they come to be. Yeah, I mean the deviants are just they're they're still the same species. There's just for some weird reason, whether it's you know just a blip in the DNA or their environment or some story like one of their abilities is exasperated. So like the Rathalos can fe- breathe fire much better than the regular ones, and the Rathian can poison the shit out of you. All I know about Dread King Rathalos for sure is that his the substance that he uses to breathe fire is special <clears throat> compared to the compared to the ones found on a normal Rathalos. So it's so that's all I really know about it. It's just that the substance he breathes is just different enough from the normal Rathalos that is more powerful. Interesting. Spam Pretty Lord. Lackluster, huh? Yeah, I mean, it, I, I was expecting something more mm. from like Azure, Pink, and Silver and Gold, but it's like, well, Azure and Pink, they grew up in a different place, and so they ate a lot of blueberries. He became Azure. <laughs> She ate a lot of strawberries and became pink. There you go. Oh, that is hilarious. I mean, ultimately, you are what you eat, so, you know, it is what it is. Uh, And then gold and and silver is basically just like, well, their ancestors. So, but we don't know who their ancestors were, but wouldn't their ancestors still be... We we do, actually. I don't know if you guys can... You knew you guys watching the podcast can't see this, but there's like... um, there's a concept art of a wyvern that it descended from. Shiro Riasu, if I remember correctly, is pronounced something like that. Uh, yeah, Shiro uh, Riasu. Sh- so the Shiro is like it's got shells because it's got really hard shells around its body. So the sh- the the Riasu is the the name. Uh, Diodeus is the name in Japanese for Rathalos. Mm-hmm. So it'd be like a sh- it'd be like a yeah. I don't know how you translate that, but yeah, the the shell Deus is the the old prototype for the dragon, so to say, his ancestor. So this is a, a monster that we've never seen in the game yet. In the game now. Oh, we'd have to go to the past, right? Because that species is like extinct yeah. by now. Yeah, it says yeah. that this is the ancestor of, of Rathalos. So, so there's like this really powerful creature, and they descend from that one, and that's why they're gold, gold Rathian and silver. Pretty well, much. It's still interesting, but it but it is a little bit like cluster. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, so moving us right along into like um wait, Second when gen? did um wait 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 when did the um Yan Garuga showed up? That was first gen. Monster right? Hunter. Monster Hunter the- Freedom, the very first just the very first freedom. He didn't appear in G he just appeared in Monster Hunter Freedom and then Dose and forth and moving forward. So he's the result of a really brave uh Yan Kutku. E- unlikely, though I will say I did learn in one of the older books that they did imply that it was that it was suggested that maybe it is a hybrid, which I was like, oh my god, don't do this to me. <laughs> I, I, I thought that, least- that was actually confirmed. Was it not that a Yan Kutku mated with a Rathian and then, you know, that thing came out? That's just an old joke. A lot of people say, but and one book is implied that it might be a case. So it's like, we really don't know. So we, ac- we actually don't know where Yan Garuga's come from. I always thought the dude, I, I always liked to imagine, dude, imagine the coup I was like, you know what? <laughs> I wish I had a book with me, but it did mention that, which I was surprised by because I'm like, <laughs> I've been saying for the longest that, that crap was never true. But after seeing, I was like, I'm like, are you serious? So now I actually have to tell people about that that might actually be true. 
it's not confirmed, but it's hard do to you, say. Do you, do you know which book or? It's just it's, it's just so hilarious. It was the encyclopedia book specifically specifically for Young Aruga. I have it, but I don't have it with me right now. But encyclopedia, which would that be Monster Hunter? Oh, the first one, right? I, Monster I, Hunter Dulce. I just like imagining like a Yan Kutku like sitting sitting in a forest, like looking over a tree or something, going like mm-hmm. that Rathian tail looking mighty fine today. <laughs> Oh my god. It's the, it's the Monster Hunter Dose, Monster Hunter Encyclopedia book. You know, that one that comes with the figure. <laughs> yeah. You guys can't see it in the podcast, but Gaijin's like flashing. I got it right here. I'm checking the facts as to whether or not it was a very brave Yan Kutku that decided oh to have his way with a Rathian. <laughs> here you go. There's the, the equal dragon weapon. <laughs> Good god. So this book was never released in English, just so you guys know the encyclopedias. World is the first time that I know of that they've ever translated and released an encyclopedia for a main game. It's already it's already bad enough I own a lot of those books and I look through them actually weekly now. <clears throat> they're, they're really interesting. Yeah, and they tell you some stuff that you probably <laughs> would never have thought of. That's the the interesting thing that whenever whenever like they talk about uh, certain things about a monster, like how they combine things, like I didn't even know that Royal Ludroth had a sponge until Rise, because <laughs> I just had no idea. Like I I thought he just looked that way because it would look cool, but it, no, it's a sponge so that he can stay hydrated. Like the little details that you get on every single monster is so incredibly sick. Uh, but, but while Gaijin's looking up the facts over there on whether or not a Yan Kutku got lucky with a Rathian. Yeah, like, I just uh, want to check with you. Is that the page that you're talking about? It's and actually, so it. it's another, it's a completely another book. It's, it's the Monster, it it's the Monster Hunter, it's the Monster Hunter Dose Monster Ecology book volume. It's volume, I think, too. It's, it's a book that comes with, it's essentially oh. a book that comes with a figure. He's, he's, he's getting the other book. <laughs> but okay, well, while he's doing that, um, what about... Um, you're, you're not talking about these, are you? Oh, not at all. These, these are really interesting it's books. Much, it's much older. So, um, what about um, Poke Village? Like, what are, like, the, the NPCs of interest that we have there? Obviously, that's, like, one of the fan favorites. Everybody that has ever watched the Gaijin video has listened to the Poke Village theme. Oh. I'll show you later, Gaijin Hunter. I'll show you what I'm talking about when I get a chance. Okay. But let me think. Poke is... Let me talk about the great sword, the giant great sword that's in um, Poke Village. That great sword is interesting. It came from the Poke's chief's ancestors, which you can tell from that great sword were huge. Poke chief being that the little old lady, right? That gives you quests and stuff? Yeah. Her ancestors, <laughs> her ancestors, one of her ancestors wielded that great sword to take down, I think it was, it was either Akator or Eucanalos or it was both. I can't remember exactly. It was one of those two. It's been a while. So this is the, if I remember correctly, this is a sword that you could mine, right? You'd yep. be able to mine it in between quests? Like I, I do yeah. remember the sword being like pretty friggin' huge, but I haven't played Freedom Unite in so long. And, and Freedom Unite was yeah. actually like the game that clicked for me because I, I really like the the stuff that you would do in between quests. It was such a little ritual. It's just like, oh, let's go into the farm and, and do a little little farming and then go mine the sword and then, you know, send the palicos in with the bombs and whatnot and now. Oh, let's go rub the pig for good luck, and then let's go. Because it was like, I would always rub the pig for good luck. It was actually hard to rub the pig on, on Poke Village. Yeah. <laughs> you actually can still see that great sword in Generations Ultimate and even mine it. The freaky thing about that, the freaky thing about that great sword is that it seemingly regenerates after, after being mined, which I always found that to be odd. Is there an explanation that they've given so far? Or? It's, I mean, since it's the Black Sword, it's, and, well, the Black Sword is usually associated with Fatalis, you could, 
possibly put two and two together, but that one is up in the air. So technically speaking, you would have to, if that is indeed a Fatalis weapon, you would have to assume that like the ancestors from the Poke Village chief would have killed a Fatalis and then made a sword out of Fatalis materials and then killed the Yukonlos with it. Is Yukonlos even weak to dragon? And nowadays he is, but it's like I said, it's hard to say. Which if they did indeed kill Fatalis, it just proves that is that the OG Wavarians, they were tough. Yeah, they were some bad mofos. <laughs> or maybe they cheated like Gaijin and they just like used the under underclaw. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Steel scales off of Fatalis. <laughs> So we have uh, the um, the Poke Village chief. We have our ancestors. We have the sword. Um, the flagship for that one, if I remember correctly, was Tigrex. Correct? Yep, Tigrex. He's he's an interesting one. You see, his main habitat, from my understanding, is the desert, and he does go into the snowy mountains, but. He isn't a big fan of the cold, but he really loves the taste of popo meat. Goes in there. Yeah, they're tasty. I mean, everybody likes the taste of popo meat. And despite the cold environment, he goes up there and just goes ham on the popo there. And he is, and since he lives in the desert and in the in tundra regions, he actually doesn't have much competition from other predators. So those places being those two main habitats he's often seen in, he basically doesn't have to worry about challenging any other creatures. And even if he does, other monsters, other monsters tend to try to avoid him, including the other flying wavens. Tigrex's immense speed and his aggression, aggression is enough to scare off most other predators, preventing them from attacking him. And and due to that, due to that reason, they a lot of them. When Tigress enters the territories of other monsters, they're just forced to tolerate him until he leaves. <laughs> That's like one of the most alpha things I've ever heard. It's, it's like that one dude that goes into your house, goes into your refrigerator, drinks your beer, looks you in the eye while he's doing it, and then goes and takes a dump in your toilet and then leaves and you don't do anything about it. <laughs> I mean, you can't really, you can't really blame the other monsters. T-Rex is just he's just too aggressive. So, what's the the thing uh cuz I know that there's like some kind of a justification behind the reason as to why like his legs start I say legs, I'm talking about like his front claws start glowing red whenever like he's enraged and stuff. It's it's due to blood rushing into his body and it seems like I forgot the exact reasoning, but he uses... Gaijin, do you remember the reason? Because I'm trying to remember here. Oh, for... God, and I did a video on this as well. I feel so bad. <laughs> it's still the AM. Give me a break. Uh, yeah, well, if I uh, remember correctly, I think it was... Um, I think that was just to hope to maintain, just to increase his athletic ability as well as his strength. Just to... Just to give him, like, I guess you can say an adrenaline boost when attacking. So, from um, from Freedom, we went to, like, what was the, the final monster of Freedom? Because, like, you know, if Egrex is the flagship, I've, I've never finished Freedom. So. It was Nargakuga. Damn. I mean, Nargakuga was the flagship for that game. So I, I, I'm lost when it comes to the Western names for these games. I mean, Narga, I thought, was from Freedom Unite. Yeah, Freedom Unite. That's what I meant. And freedom is Portable se Yeah, so Portable Second is Tigrex, and I think... God, who was the second, last boss? Of so so yeah. who's the last boss on the Tigrex one? That's what I was asking. Whichever one's the Tigrex one. I can't tour. I can't tour. Yeah, okay, yeah, you're right. And so then it was... Us, so tell us about the lore of a Cantor. Because, like, doesn't a Cantor... Like, the name in Japanese is, like, this super godly... Because I remember that I was very much underwhelmed the first time that I fought a Cantor because, like, I read somewhere that his name was, like, this implication that he was, like, the god of all monsters or something ridiculous like that, wasn't it? Oh, uh, no, I think, I think it is the nickname god. they give him, the, the Black God or something, like, crazy like that. Yeah. Yep, the Black God. 
like uh, the the disaster, the great calamity. Or as and we that, call them in Japan, the bank the bank of a cantor. I don't know if you guys know about that. I have no idea what the, the hell of, is that. The, the bank of a, in all the old games, you'd have a hard time trying to get zenny, and and cantor parts sell for like a butt ton of zenny. So people would just farm and sell his materials. So they call him the Bank of a Cantor. That's in Japanese and English as well. <laughs> but tell tell us more about his lord, Dino. From my understanding, a cantor, his habitat range is semi seemingly isn't limited to the volcanoes. It seems like he seems like he goes to a wide range of different areas, and whenever he appears, it seems like. It seems like it scares off a bunch of other monsters, including well, including flying worms that live within the volcano. And the f- interesting thing about him is he likes he likes eating armored prey. Which, if you've seen his ecology video, well, you already seen what kind of armored prey he likes to eat. Sometimes I haven't I haven't seen the video. <laughs> What's the armored prey? Hunters? Gravios. Oh, gravios. He likes to eat gravios. Surprisingly, yeah. That's always been... That just show, goes to show how strong he is. A cantor, he's like feared by so many different monsters and possibly even elder dragons. In fact, he's... It, it, in, fact, in fact, the guild had, um, had to evacuate some places just to avoid him damaging those places. I love the fact that he's he you'd think that he's an elder dragon, but he's actually just a flying wyvern. There's, okay, there's dude. A, <laughs> Go on, Dino. There's a fun fact about that. In the universe, he's actually classified as an older dragon before, before the guild really started studying him and began to understand him, and they then realized he was just a giant flying wyvern. Seemingly one that's more ancient than even Tigrex. And yet the guild is still too damn lazy to go and declassify the Diablo subspecies and just say that it's a Diablos in heat. Yeah. <laughs> the guild, man, they, they got to get so, to it. But I, how is he supposed to be a... Fl- he doesn't have any wings. His ancestral lineage, actually, any of the ancient flying wavens seemingly didn't have any kind of wings, which is one of the reasons why Tigrex is often called primitive. Tigrex is the direct descendant of, of, a, of a flying wavern known as Wavern Rex, which is considered to be the ancestor of all flying waverns. Well, mm. I can't. Well, before Wavern Rex, there was another wavern, one that we just simply dubbed the Origin Wavern, that's more ancient than even Wavern Rex. And seemingly, Acantor and Eucanalos are closely related to that ancient wavern. And it could be assumed that they're more closely re- they might be more closely related to it in terms of ancestral lineage than um than Waven Rex. So that could explain why they don't have wings. Presumably presumably the origin Waven might have not have wings itself and Waven Rex just eventually started evolving them. The more we talk about like these ancient monsters and stuff does really make me is really, you know, wish uh, makes me wish that we had a monster hunter that is like, let's just go back to the past and we could have like, you know, more primitive weapons and whatnot. And we would actually hunt like some of these older monsters, like the the species that Silverlos and Gold Ian descend from, this Wyvern Rex, the one that came before Wyvern Rex. Like that just sounds so interesting. And there's just like so much stuff there that they could do with the game. But they would have That's to explain, like, this is concept art, yeah. Monster Hunter Origins, right? Like, that would be cool. Monster Hunter Origins. You go back. You guys heard it. He predicted it the next game for PlayStation <laughs> 5 and Xbox Series X. Monster Hunter Origins going into the ancient civilization. The yeah, roots right, of it all. Like, I think that would actually be really bad from a product standpoint because, like, Takes if you're going... Cancel trade. How do you, how would you explain like oh here's Rathalos like well what do you mean we're supposed to be in ancient times how does that work? <laughs> they can just say that they can just say that those monsters just started appearing recently, kind of yeah, like so how, Wes Anderson you know he he helped pen it so he can do some cross uh, isekai crap. Could fight an ancient uh, an equal dragon weapon, and we can fight it with five people because the rule around four didn't exist yet. <laughs> 
Jesus. Oh, man. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> well, hey, it makes sense. PlayStation 5, five people. <laughs> oh. I, cr- I cracked the code. <laughs> Good gosh. No, oh, but um, so how do we go from a Cantor to Candela? So, I mean, obviously from a gameplay perspective, it's like, okay, here's the fire version. Here's the ice version. Is there like lore explanations for that at all? Or with you Cantalos, it's like, it's like seemingly whenever he appears, there's many avalanches. And it seems like he hibernates deep within the, the snowy mountains where he inhabits. And not, it doesn't appear very often. Like when he appears, it's a big deal. What makes Yukanalo so dangerous is the fact that what was I was about to say? It's like it's like he's this, he's destructive in nature like a cantor, and it's feared that if, if he and and cantor ever encountered each other, he would get in a massive fight, which would cause which would cause massive yeah, destruction to them to the surrounding ecosystem. Yeah, it's, I like to think about it is they only had one year to make him, so they're like, okay, let's make a different version of a cantor, but for the ice map. <laughs> so, so, but the guild has actually never seen this. This is just a theory, right? He was just, at least back in Freemian Night, Yukanos was always treated as like a legend. He didn't believe, they didn't think that thing actually existed. But. Wavarians knew about knew that this creature existed, but since it was always seen as a legend, it really wasn't like anything to really write home about. So boom, it popped up one day. All these towns getting hit by legends. It's it's a running theme, I guess. The legends were true. Like you, sh- you. I guess you just shouldn't live in a village. You should just live by yourself in a hut somewhere. Then you wouldn't have as many problems. Just be like yes. the. Um, the, the what are they called the veggie elders whatever the <laughs> veg, veggie elders right uh yeah the dudes you trade with i mean if i was in monster hunter i would go to a village and say hey do you have an old tale of this village being destroyed once by an elder dragon okay i'll go to another village so just keep moving on until i find <laughs> you know it's gonna happen again i'm gonna move yes. to the next village <laughs> it's like there's so many legends at this point it's like it's like there's so many legends at this point, you might as well just treat them all as true to some degree. Yeah, it's a story cliche at this point. The legends are true. It exists. Oh my God. Even though it's in a map that we go in like every other day. <laughs> so I guess those if- hot, air guy, hot air balloon guys really don't do a good job. And they're like, oh, we, we can't spot him. He's only, you know, 500 meters long. <laughs> <laughs> this, this actually makes me remember <clears throat> something about chameleos a long time ago. Like, when researchers went to study that older dragon with hunters, while they were trying to study it, Camillos was just looting them like crazy. Camillos is a trickster by nature, and, well, he actually likes stealing other, all sorts of things to force, to force other creatures out of his territory, particularly humans. So he kept stealing all their food and stuff, and the researchers eventually gave up and just left. There's too much. Camilla's like someone Just finishes. Everything. It's like in rotisserie. Like this little, this little steak. Dun, 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 dun. He so lifts it up. So tasty. And then when he goes to eat it, there's nothing in his hand. Camilla's already stolen. <laughs> it's like sitting there, like, like nabbing everything. <laughs> I really hope we get Camellios back in Rise. I love that monster. Same. <laughs> That's hilarious that they gave up like figuring him out <laughs> because he kept robbing them. <laughs> All we know is we lose. Reason. Yeah, we lose our shit every time we go in that direction. Let's not go back there again. <laughs> he could in in the older games. He could like even steal like power charms and stuff, right? Yeah. Whoa, I did not know that. Holy <laughs> crap. I, I, would, had, I would rage if that happened. I haven't had that happen in GU. I don't know if they coded that out of GU, but uh, yeah. <laughs> Camellios did not show us mercy back then. <laughs> maybe now he, he, maybe he'll eat our wire bugs in this game if he comes back. That'd be funny. And you have to go and you have to go to a map to reclaim it again. 
I remember the first That'd be time. Really I- cool. Actually, that would be really good because I, I own a lizard. I mean, I have a, a pet gecko. Like they love eating flies and like insects. Like that would make sense if chameleons came in ate and fed on wire bugs. It would make total sense. Yeah. Mm. That's his ability. Like he hits you with an attack and he triggers the cooldown on your wire bug. No, I'm thinking that it takes it away. Like you just don't have a wire, but you're down to one wire bug. You either have to collect one at the map or whatever. Like imagine if he eats your wire bugs. Don't say that. <laughs> it, put, it puts it on <laughs> cooldown. Ideas. <laughs> It 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 gives it a big cooldown, but that's about it. Okay, don't take my wire bugs away, man. I I need my make it happen. My make count. it happen. No, <laughs> no stealing of wire bugs. But it would be funny. Like you you'd be getting ready to do like a move, and you're just like, it's your bug. <laughs> it's just like what? Or maybe even so pulls you win. Like, that'd be cool. In the sake of actually finishing all the villages, do you want to move on to third gen? Uh yeah sure. Uh, which one do you want to start with, of... Olga or or Yukumu? Uh, I don't know which one. Do you know which or Dino? 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 Which one do you want to start with? Let's start with Moga. <sighs> My home. Sweet Moga. Third Fleet Podcast. This is our home. There's there's we, no we, place we, like this, home. This is where I grew up. You know, this is where I was born. <laughs> so uh, let me see. Actually, sweet nostalgic feelings i actually i actually looked through the book for this today so this is actually perfect but at least back in the quote-unquote early days of the third gen we used to look at we used to look at mocha kind of like as we describe it the sort of quote-unquote new world because that was a part of the that was a part that was actually never really explored by the guild or the royal paleontology scrub in the years before a lot of the monsters in well, a lot of those regions that they that were first appeared during the third gen was just completely unknown, and a lot of the species were also completely unknown. It was like a new frontier for them. And by going through the by going through those places, they actually did discover well, some new species never before seen, like the Feigned Wavens, Leviathans, and Brute Wavens. So Leviathans only showed up in, in third gen? That was the very first. That was the very first time they were ever discovered, and the funny enough, the very first one, at least seemingly the very first one they ever discovered, was Legiacris. <laughs> and in so, the past, in the past, awesome. Legiacris was actually just considered to be a legend amount around the village, around the villages in that area. It was always seen like some kind of um, foretelling. I guess you can say. Some kind of like demon, some kind of demon of the sea. Yeah, I feel bad for the guild receptionist. I was there, Aisha. She's like, grows up, wants to leave her little fishing village. She finally gets big enough. She goes off to like Loklak City. She's studying. Then she finds out some like stupid Leviathan is causing havoc. So she's like, okay, I'm going back home. <laughs> so she has to go back to Moga Village to help oversee the hunters. Put you know, put it under control. Yeah. Poor girl. And that village is at least near that village, or at least near that village is, is the ruins of a of the of an ancient civilization that once lived there that is a part of the Mogus chief's ancestral lineage, which was that ancestral lineage was destroyed by well Sidious, who well kinda like not kinda like in the story of Monster Hunter Tribe was causing earthquakes by rubbing his horn against the seafloor, causing earthquakes. Sorry, which monster? Sidious. Oh, okay. I, I can never Dang. tell what the... the I, n- I have no idea how to pronounce the monster, so okay. The final monster. <laughs> yes. Sidious, bas- Sidious or Sidious, basically... Seemingly, Sidious was doing... was was rubbing his horn on the... was on the, on the seafloor. It's, um, I guess, shaping, reshaping his horn... I don't know mm. for certain. I haven't really looked into that monster much in a while, and which caused those earthquakes. It wasn't trying to do that stuff intentionally. It was just trying to, um, yeah. it was just trying to fix its horn. Poor guy. And then we go down there and kill it, and we bust its horn off and make gear out of it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Poor thing. I always knew the hunters were the villains all along. Like he's just trying to fix they his are. horn. Let he's got a niche, pre- you know. Like, come on. He's got to scratch his horn. He's, is is Sia this considered an elder dragon? I forget. Yes. Since since I no, guess he's a he flying wyvern. No. 
<laughs> guess since because he doesn't fit into any other well known categories. Yes. Which, I, I love the how the guild just says if we don't if we can't figure it out, it's an elder dragon. Fuck it. <laughs> That's basically the argument that um, me and a, a friend of mine would have towards why we considered uh, Nergigante to be a cannibal. It's like, well, he eats other elder dragons, he eats his own, therefore, cannibal. I wouldn't be surprised that Nergigante eat each other to begin with anyway. See, th- there you go. Confirm. Nergigante mm-hmm. is a cannibal. There you go. There you go. Well, it it wouldn't, it wouldn't exp- surprise me if the Nergigante we run into is female and she eats the male that she mates with. That would make sense. There's animals that do that, right? Yep. Yeah. It's uh, that book already, that book made me question Nergigante's breeding habits so much. It was like when they said, you know, you know, the way they talked about how Nergigante reproduces. How, how is it? I actually, I have no idea. We, we ha- I haven't seen that book. I haven't seen any book. It's, believe it or not, true with spikes. At least that's the running theory anyway. Spikes? So, yeah. so like he throws a spike out and like a little Nergigante grows out of his spike? <laughs> yeah, if enough bioenergy is in one of the spikes, Nergigante could basically make a clone of itself without having to reproduce. Which, the Immaculate Conception. Yeah, which it isn't too crazy for an Elder Dragon, especially considering... Especially considering the Mogula, so I don't think it's impossible, but you know, we don't know much about Nergigante, so we'll never know for certain. Yes, we just know that the guild has some really fun theories. Oh my god. Well, let's let's bring it back to uh the Sea of this. So Sea of this is an elder dragon, just wanted to scratch his horn, and then we have to go in there and kill him because of it. Is is that about the extent of the Sea of this? The other thing we're noting is the um, luminous bacteria that it um, cultivates, I believe, in its beard. It uses that to make this luminous algae that this algae that it uses for oxygen. And, and by, growing this, uh, by growing this algae, Sidious has a uh, constant oxygen supply underwater. And he actually can stay underwater for about six months without having to ever surface. Which could explain why, why he wasn't known until recently. Is that- he's, a, he's a cool monster. I like him. And it goes, and it goes even further. Yes, Oldbeard is just an older Sidious. That's basically has been growing that algae and bacteria on his body for his entire life, which caused it to turn gold. Since, since he has so much of that stuff on his body now. He never ha- he actually never, if ever, has to rarely ever surface. He can just stay underwater for his entire life. What is so I, Goldbeard? Is that from 3U? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So called the so called subspecies of Sidious, despite just being uh older Sidious. Yeah. So here's here's a here's a good question for you guys. We'll see how accurate you guys can get. If you were to take Lady Dimit- if you were to take Lady Dimitrescu from Resident Evil Village, how many of her would equal the length of a of a Cetus? Ooh. That monster. Uh, Wild guesses. She's a tall girl, so. <laughs> Ooh, this is something tough. She she's gonna be my new measuring pole for everything. I would I would go with five. I she, would you go think she's that with, tall? Yes. I would go with. I want to go with fifty. Okay, you guys are both way off. So the the Acetus length is the length of uh, twenty Lady Dimitrescu's <laughs> laid up together. I that was, would be the length. I was, of them. I was thinking that too. Oh man! <laughs> Sorry for that random knowledge, there, guys. I, I, I... <laughs> Gaijin is obsessed with with the the vampires in Resident Evil Village. Everyone is. <laughs> yeah, l- lately it definitely it's seems like stick. it. It's, it's it's hilarious okay. how viral that thing is gone, dude. It's like everybody's been talking about vampire ladies recently. That's good. Um, so, anything, so what else is there in a note for? I mean, I, I I just this one this one is more of a personal thing that I want to know. Like, yeah. what do what do you know special about Kurupeku? Like, I love Kurupeku as. I just love the sounds. Like, this just like calls the other monsters. I freaking love it. <laughs> 
with Quarrel Peko, his um best way to describe it, his beak is hollow. He's able to suck in, he's sucking in air through the air sack on his throat and breathe and using the vibrations produced by the air in its is able to produce its unique roars via its hollow beak, which is how it's able to mimic the calls of so many different monsters. Each core Peko knows the different calls of certain monsters depending on the area they're from, which, of course, in some cases, is our good old friend, Devil Joe. I want to hear Kuda Peko, like, do a basil. Go, You bastard! I actually didn't. I actually didn't know that. That's how Kudupek worked. So basically, the the stuff on his chest is just a microphone, kinda. <laughs> yeah. If, if, well, it, um, <laughs> well, his beak acts like a megaphone. Such a cool monster. <laughs> that, that would create one hell of a feedback loop. That microphone is way too close to the to the speakers. <laughs> Wouldn't work. But yeah, I, I just think that Kudupek was a really interesting monster. Uh, that that's why I wanted to know. But like. Uh, I don't. I don't remember like every single monster that I cared about from from Dry. Like obviously, Lodgy, big deal. Like, do do we know what the reasoning is behind Ivory? It's like Ivory doesn't go into the water, if I remember right. Yeah, it's with Ivory. I want to. What I know about Abyssal, I sometimes debate whether Ivory is really a subspecies or not. But the thing is, with Ivory. His white color is caused by quartz that he's been eating, which has caused his hide to turn white. And those quartz actually help him generate electricity on land, which is something, well, most normal a guy Chris can't do. And since, and because of that, he's able to stand, stay on land much longer than a much than a normal guy Chris, though his abilities underwater is basically about the same as a normal guy Chris. It's just that his land based abilities are just on another level. And count on the Legai Chris from Generations, of course. It is a cool monster. Do you guys think uh, Laggy will be back for Rise? Yes or no? 100%. Everyone seems to think so, but I, I've got... I thought he was going to be know. back in World. I thought they were going to be able to figure out the, the problems that they had, and they were gonna just like be able to bring him back in World. So I, I honestly doubt it, if I'm being honest. I'm I getting my doubts only for the fact that the maps don't seem wide enough to support having meaningful gameplay with them. I don't know. It just with him being out of water feels a little wrong sometimes. It could try to do the Jeratotus thing. That's all I could say. Oh good God no. No. Look at he's he's a shark now. <laughs> good good old mud penis. No. <laughs> That's what okay, it is. I, I did not need that image in my mind. So I'm I think, sorry, dude. That's I think what we he need is. to move on to another topic. <laughs> This might be a good. Let's time let's go back to yoga. talking about vampire girls. It's a lot better than mud penises. Come on, you can go, go ahead, to Yokuma now if you want. Okay, take us through Yokumo. Yokumo. It's dang. It's been a long time since I talked about Yokuma, but or Yokuma. Uh, I pronounce it like three different ways. Let me uh, see. Yukumo. Yeah. So I mean, the the basis for this one is I I like it a lot because it's. It's one of the first games where you see like the final boss in the intro sequence. You get a hint of the Amatsu in the air because yeah. I mean the village is up in the mountains. It's it's a relatively safe place, but Zenogers are coming down from on top of mountains and causing havoc. And they normally wouldn't be coming down that way, but the problem is that there's all these storms happening because the Amatsu is traveling through the area. So the Amatsu is creating the natural catastrophe which is causing monsters that normally aren't that aggressive they wouldn't come down to the village to come down and so it creates a huge problem for the village so i just think it's just a really nice tied up story it goes together really well i think yeah <laughs> with a matsu it's always in it's like with a matsu he's just highly territorial it's like he forced his an ogre out of their original home because he claimed that place for itself essentially he's, yeah it's, i i like this spot i'm gonna sleep here Get out. <laughs> and then all the Zendogre just come run come running down the mountain towards closer to Yokuma village, causing causing the hunters go to, to um lift the band off of hunting the Zenogre. We get to go and kick some electric doggy butt, which is nice. 
Why was there a ban on hunting and ogres during during Portable Third? It was like they were a rare monster that wasn't often seen, so there wasn't really a need to well hunt them. But due to Amatsu's activity, it became a problem for the village. So, so the girl lifted the hunting ban off them, so so that hunters could protect them from this from the from the thunder wolf. Yeah, it's it's going back to the hunters guild. It's sort of like government how they'll regulate like there's certain fish you can fish and certain ones you're allowed you have to put back in the water if you fish them out and stuff. Like certain countries do that. They're just trying to protect the the monsters species and they don't want people going out for sport and killing monsters for the hell of it. Well, it seems that changed in later games, that's for sure. But it's open hunting in the new world. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's it's for science. Like you the guys hunt. You you guys you guys you guys seem to forget it's for science. It's all for science, okay? Pretty, pretty soon people are gonna say that you're supporting that that guy that wrote about uh how it was like themes of colonialism and whatnot in the new world. <laughs> that was a crazy article. Um what other what other monsters of note were there in Portable Third? Because that one I didn't play at all, because that one didn't actually come to the West. I since I don't speak Japanese, I was like, well, so I'm missing out on that one. The Ramboros. Let me see. I was gonna say, if you played Monster Hunter 3 Ultimate, it's amazing how similar those games feel outside the village. Like just with the monster roster and, and the maps and stuff. They they mm-hmm. they feel quite at home and similar. Um Wait, Durambros, is that the one with the tail that spins? Mm-hmm. Yep. Oh dude, I love that dude, man. He's the best. <laughs> When he starts spinning, <laughs> you got your, your gun lance out. Dunk, 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 dunk. Oh. <laughs> Literally yeets himself. Now listen, guys. For anyone that is is watching or listening to this, and you've only ever played Monster Hunter World, like if you ever see Durambros, he's like one of the most hilarious monsters ever because he just like he spins around and then uses the counterweight on his tail. To yeet himself at you, and that is just so freaking. And he is huge, yeah. If you get him to trip, then he just like, and sometimes he slides away with his tail. <laughs> so, what can you tell the us Durand about his Burrow, The Ramboros, most of the ones we encounter in game, at least from my understanding, are males. Male Duramboros, they live, they're pretty much solitary in nature, at least until the mate season. During them, female Duramboros, on the other hand, they live in large herds, but they're young. So, generally speaking, since we always, since we generally, for the most part, always hunt just one Duramboros in a quest, most of the ones we encounter are males. All the females are just living in these large herds with their young. Which is pretty terrifying to imagine a whole herd of them when you think about it. Not to mention that that makes me wonder: like, are we bringing them to extinction? We're basically taking out all of the males of the species. Like, <laughs> that doesn't seem right. But then again, it's and it's they, like that old thing. Just like uh, Rathalos will bag a bunch of Rathians. You know, one Durambros he gets loose in the middle of one of them herds, and wee. <laughs> but Durambros is like, it's like when this. It's like the. They're known to sometimes hibernate during colder months, and they're known to eat a large amount of food, which includes which includes the homes of some people, to just to gain as much weight as possible so they can survive the winter. They'll go underground, they'll go underground to hibernate, and then when it becomes warmer, they emerge from underground once again and continue their normal activities. It's a cool monster. It it like I love that fight. Like Durambros is one of my tens down so much fun. Every time he knocking just off his tail is action. really satisfying too, because it knocks off the like the huge casing to the tail. Chunk. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and you and you break off its back and you expose a weak point for massive damage. You know, it's it's neat. It's got multiple facets to the fun the fight. That guy, that guy is definitely like him. Uh, what else we got in in Yakumo? Notice. I kind of want to mention Mizutsune since he fits the theme, but he's a four-gen monster, so it's like, hmm, maybe? Mizutsune? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, sure. I mean, I mean, th- yeah, it's it's not third generation, but it's it's the the area that it pops up into, right? Yep. 
The, uh, so, oh, what's the name of that map again? Misty Peaks. Misty Peaks. Misty Peaks. Yeah. But Mizutsune, Mizutsune has, like, he's unusual amongst the Leviathans due to the fact that he spends most of his time on land. And, and to help him stay on land for long periods of time, he has multiple glands on his body that secretes this, I guess, best way to describe it, this bubbly fluid that he uses to keep his skin moist. And when this fluid is rubbed against the is rubbed against the fur on his body, it creates bubbles. It, weird. The interesting part about the so-called bubbles is that Izutsune it doesn't use them to capture prey or anything like that. It more so uses it to its advantage to move, to outmaneuver well its to potential predators and enemies. You guys remember the intro with Zenoger when Zenoger was attacking that Mizutsune? Yeah. It's basically when Mizusane encounters a threat, it'll cover that threat in its bubbly fluids, and other and when the when it's covered the prey enough, when it's covered the predator enough in those fluids, it'll then just slide away while the predator just tries to regain his foot and while trying to chase Mizusane down. I love the way he slides, yeah, right. like slipping and sliding. Here we go. <laughs> It's interesting that the you know it's it's more defensive than aggressive. It just it's trying to I think in the intro they said for generations it's actually zipping around the Zenogre specifically to wear it out, um, not yeah. to necessarily attack it. Yeah. Um Zeus and I will sometimes attack other monsters, but it more so but it tends to flee most battles rather than try to fight. But that changes when there's young involved and male Mizusune will stand their ground and attack creatures attack creatures to protect their young what is the the considering that you know from the the lore perspective he's a more peaceful monster so to speak if he usually doesn't attack he's more defensive uh what is the reasoning that they give us to like go hunt Miz it's best way to put it mel mizutsune become crazy during the main season and will basically attack just about anything they get the it, frenzy <laughs> Love frenzy, and the interesting thing is, Elmi Zutsune, they're solitary in nature, but the females they live in herds with their young. Yeah, and fe the females, at least from my understanding, they have smaller fins compared to the males, and they're less colorful compared to the males. So, yeah, they're really slim. And Males, they do they do participate in taking care of the young during the breeding season, but once the young reach a certain size and age, female herd will kick the male out. So the male will sometimes occasionally visit his kids. Yeah, they're the males are weird. I actually have tons of notes. I won't even go through them. I was actually working on my next monster feature video, which is going to be Mizutsune. Mm -hmm. I was going through all the design notes and everything from the interviews. I wonder if that has anything to do with Yuna. <laughs> <laughs> oh, she loves them. Well, the thing is, I've always wanted to do a feature on the monster, but it being only in one game, it didn't make sense. So now that I know that it's in two games, I can go ahead and do that. <laughs> it's guess... really weird. Like they were mentioning stuff like there's like the things that it was based on. Like there's a there's a type of fish that creates bubbles to protect its eggs, and that's like where they got the idea for the bubbles and stuff. It's like really interesting. The creation is really in depth, but that's it. Really, is a like a love child of of Ichinose, the director, because he really, really wanted to make like a snake monster. So, the whole snake and fox theme is is pretty much from his desire to do that in Portable Third, which he didn't get to do. Um, so that's how it came to be. Is it's it's an interesting story. I'll cover. Wolf kicked out the fox in the game. I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's not fair, but at least. But at least he got the shine on the fourth generation, so it wasn't a complete loss. Exactly. Yeah. And now we've now this this rise is gonna be all of his favorite animals back. We'll probably have Zenogre and Narga and Mizutsune and we've got Arzeros, all these fun portable third monsters. All of those and then some. Sure. And then some, yeah. I guess so, so you wanna move you wanna, you wanna move to generation four or <laughs> let's do it. So in here we have a lot of villages. Like I don't even remember exactly the the story of for you. We had the caravaneer. and whatnot. Yeah. Like what what was I mean, we were chasing down Jan, right? Jen Ran? 
Oh, Aaron. Th- Aaron Moran? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so like Carrie Veneri wanted to track down the origins of a of a mysterious artifact. This this piece of something that he got. And so basically it's he assembled a team, right? So as you go through Valhavar and you run into him, you guys sort of start forming a, a team, a guild. And you, the guys as a moving caravan, start going on an adventure across all the different villages to find the origins of what it is. And then you come across with the the ace hunters and your paths collide when it comes to obviously the Gormagala and everything starts to come to light. Oh man. It's such a good story. It's I mean, it's not in depth or anything. It's just the sense of adventure, like you're saying, like the the variation that we got and moving from village to village and oh no, you know, we, we can't have the the blacksmiths are out of business because the tetsukabra is blocking the path well let's go take care of it and then the village is up and running and you just get a good sense of progression that is the best story (laughs) so let me see because oh man this is tough i'm trying to think about it i guess so we have like tons of villages right i mean valhabar is sort i would say the the true hub of the game right that's where you start which is kind of like a pack up and move around kind of like merchant town um then that's outside the place where you fight the Darren Moran. But there's just travelers from all different lands, right? And so and it's the other new village. They had, yeah. So I, I did a video and, and uh, Dino helped me out as well with trying to just p- put together some of the piece, the puzzle pieces. But just trying to give an idea of what the overall map of Monster Hunter World looks like. Because we have official maps like from the encyclopedias, but they're usually for the older games. They don't really cover everything in specific huge detail. So there's a lot of unknowns. Uh, so we're just trying to take pieces of um, tips and stuff that we're getting from in-game dialogue and other graphics to try to piece it together. But I do love the fact that Monster Hunter all takes place in one world. Like it's all connected. Like we know exactly where Poke Village is in relation to Kokoto and stuff like that. And we can infer and guess where the locations of some of the other villages are. I just love that it's all connected, you know, and that makes sense now with, for ultimate and the, the journey, right? You go from low Glack, then you go to Ruri, your favorite, which is Hearth, which is Hearth. the uh, the it's the best village the, ever, the volcanic village. Then you get your your boat, and then you go off into sea. You get hit by the Gormagala. You wash up on the Chiki stand, the Chico Sands, or the Palico Village, I didn't um, even which is right Chico below Chico Sands, dude. Chico Sands, good. <clears throat> But Chico Sands is right below, sort of, it's near the area where the, like, the flooded forest, right, with the, the pyramid and everything, so it's not too off, too far off from there. <laughs> then from there, where did we go? Um, we went then to Yukomo's, no, what am I talking about, Yuma? that wasn't Kat-tier. that game. Kathir, I think it's pronounced. Uh, Kathar, yeah. So that's Kat-tier. the, um, that's, <clears throat> that's the Wyvarian village uh, up in the mountains, and that's where we have our climatic showdown with the Shagaru Magara, which is Shagara. nice. And the Shaggy. eventually Dala. Dalamadur? Yeah, Dalamadur's up in the mountains as well. Spear yeah, I never, I never got, or whatever it's called. I never got the fight Dalamadur. I didn't play that much for you. Oh, Man, no. I missed out so Such much. Such a good hunt. Like I, I just, it's like, it's so hard to just, oh man, I gotta go. I really wish they would this. remaster it on the Switch. That game deserves a remaster, doesn't it? A lot of the so, games do. <laughs> Yeah. yeah true that in particular though i'd say but um tell us I, I guess tell us about uh gore or any meaningful npcs that you can think of in for you i, I guess i'll start off with i guess i'll start off with the ace cadet <laughs> as we all know the ace cadet he's a part of the ace hunters he's an interesting fellow that what makes him unique is that he's pretty he's pretty adaptable. He can use just about any weapon just by use he can use just about any weapon. And he really shows that off in Iceborne, I feel. Yep. Yeah. And that's one of the reasons why he's considered an ace hunter. He may be a cadet, but he's highly skilled and he's high, he's highly skilled in just about on a lot of different arts, including combining and creating different items. Yeah, because like, like, even even though we're talking about like for you, uh, for people that maybe don't know, like the ace cadet in for you is like the what do they call him? The excitable A lister. Excitable A lister, yeah. 
is the excitable A-lister in Monster Hunter World. It's the same character. Like, this is actually officially confirmed. That's why we're talking about World for you. But I'm, I'm sorry, keep going. And they finally gave him a name, Aiden. Yeah. Aiden. Yeah. And he has a cameo in the movie as well. I mean, I haven't seen the movie because it's not out here, but uh, I believe he appears as the excitable A-lister in the Monster Hunter movie. That's he pretty- does. I haven't seen him in the movie, but from what I've heard, they... From what I heard, they did him dirty in the movie. <laughs> Uh-oh. Oh. No. Oh, no. Poor Aiden. I don't know what exactly happened to him, but they said, all I know is they said they did him dirty in the movie. Wow. I'll, I'll have to wait to see. I, I've been hearing lots of interesting, different opinions, but... Uh, <laughs> but I anyway... Just, I, I, like the, I, like, I like the fact that the ace cadet is like in love with the guild marm, but the guild marm's in love with Brackadios. Brac- <laughs> she she's all oh, she's into monsters and <laughs> she has no interest in him. <laughs> at least at least he tried. That's all I can say. At least he tried. Mm. <laughs> Poor guy. Who, who knows? He might he might find love in the new world for all we know. Yeah, I hear I hear so I, I'm kinda curious though, when it comes hot. to the aces. <laughs> <laughs> God. I had to do it, dude. I had to do. <laughs> oh Lord! You guys have to remember it's very late night, so uh, that the weird humor comes out, right? <laughs> what do you mean weird? <laughs> Vitalis is hot. <laughs> Vitalis is hot. Vitalis can melt melt steel beams. <laughs> <laughs> Yet he somehow survived that, and I'm still amazed about that. Aiden didn't burn to a crisp because Aiden is secretly a Fatalis in human disguise. Oh no. But no, I was going to say, I, I think Monster Hunter 4 is the first time we ever got, I would almost say it's probably the first husbandle for the game. I don't, I can't think of any other character in the previous games in which people, uh, a male character and people are like, that character's hot. And I think Julius, the ace commander is the first time I ever heard people refer to a character as, as being a husbandle. That's the Julius. Julius is a beast. <laughs> That's the Lancer, right? No, no, no. The the Ace Commander is Julius. It's the very awkward, uh, white haired man. I don't. Uh, I don't remember. He's crazy. Oh come on, he's great. He's he's the one that like always made like weird, like accidental like sexual innuendos in his like like may our bondage be last forever. No, I mean something else or something. Like <laughs> he had all these funny one liners. He's not a very talkative person, but he still he's, he tries. So we can't, so we can't fault him for that. He's a nice character. I like him. I hope Monsters. we see him again one day. Legends of the Guild, man, where is it? Where the heck is it? In it's development in hell. Or at least that's at least that's what we can assume. Yeah, that's gonna be that's that's his his series, man. We need it. <laughs> Let me see. I guess I can. T- I guess I can talk briefly about Gore and Shigaru. Briefly, you need to write an essay. <laughs> it's like one of the most important monsters, hands down. I, I've always, I've never been a big fan of them. To be honest, I like them, but I've never been a big fan of them. Well, except Chaotic. I really love Chaotic. Chaotic is. <laughs> Let me see. I really like. I like Gore Magala, the the base one, a lot. <laughs> I just love the fact that it it has very distinctive phases. So like, you know, when it when its horns come out, the whole skybox turns dark and, you know, the whole focus of the hunt is like, OK, I need to break his horns. I need to flinch his head. Otherwise, he's just going to like blow me up. And I just love how it changes. He he commands the tempo of the hunt, not you. And I like that a lot. Basically, Gore, he's essentially blind in a way. He he senses he senses other creatures with um with his pollen like with his pollen like scales. He leaves them around the area, especially when he senses another creatures when in the area, and when those hairs attach themselves to another creature, he can actually sense the presence of where of where the creature is at. One of the reasons why you need to try to avoid stepping into those pools he leaves behind in game, and the more Gormagawa can see. The brighter purple, and, um, I guess the light in between its wings becomes. The senses reaches their peak. Strange feelers, or I guess antennae, come out of his head. 
they now can basically see just about everything in this environment clearly. And he covers the entire area in a bunch of his hair, darkening the whole place and basically marking that place, that whole area as his territory. And let me see. But Shigaru, rather than using the hair like scales, he uses some. It never really described. It's like some kind of weird, mysterious substance. And it's. The way he uses it is actually pretty. It's pretty harsh in terms of nature. He uses it primarily to infect other monsters and to spread his virus. But he uses it for one other reason. Actually, two other reasons. The first reason is to um, prevent other Gormagala from molting into another Shigoro Mogala, which is how Chaotic Gormagala comes to be. And then he uses that very virus strand to reproduce kind of like a spore. Kind of like a kind of like a fungus via spores. The dead corpses of the frenzied monsters basically become incubators for its young, which is messed up. But at the same time, Pretty in terms cool. of fungus, it makes sense. <laughs> and chaotic, as I mentioned before, chaotic is basically the result of a gormagala trying to molt. Trying to mold when in the territory of Shigar Magala and failing. The virus, Shigar Magala's stronger virus prevents chaotic, prevents the Gormagala from molting properly, causing it to fail and to only molt halfway. And because that individual failed, because that individual failed to molt properly, only a portion of his body is Shigaru. And that stronger strand, the Shigaru side of its body is producing is actually slowly killing that individual as well. <laughs> it's a deep, dark secret with him. My God. So, chaotic, when we... so, so the Shigaru parts of Chaotic Gore is killing him. Pretty much. It's like with Chaotic, by the moats, since his body is. Uh, so I think we're you're cutting yeah, off on us. You're, you're cutting off. Okay, okay, I should be fine now. Um, the chaotics with chaotic. Essentially, we're doing chaotic a favor by killing him. He's slowly <laughs> dying anyway, so putting him out of his misery. Different. Yeah, you guys are so mean. Because we're doing him. We're doing him a favor. So when we're killing, so we hunt chaotic. We're basically doing um a solid. <laughs> So, what about the regular virus that drives other monsters crazy from the base gore? It's it's pretty much the same for all, for all of the gores for all the Mo- mogulas for the most part. It's just it's just that Shigaru's one just who happens to be the strongest version of it. But monsters, it's like it attacks their nervous system and makes them makes them more aggressive. And for the most part, it generally they eventually die from it, but there are some particularly strong monsters that can overcome the effects of the virus and become an apex monster. Is is that like, do you get like a quest for, for those apex monsters later down the line? Yep. They oh. are some of the most, they are some so of the most evil things they ever made. So Rurikan, did you, have you never faced an apex savage devil Joe before? No. Like, here's here's how here's how far I went into four ultimate. I finished the village quests, then I got started on like the first things after that, like in multiplayer. Like not not just the the higher. Like I went to some new village that I could go to at the end of everything in the hub or whatever. Yeah, and then I was starting to do quests there, and that's when I stopped playing. Man, you're missing out on what I think is the first polarizing feature of Monster Hunter, where I saw people uh, really arguing the relic the weapons apex or whatever. System. No, the apex system. There's people who passionately hate the whole mechanic of apex. So how does it because work? Because basically, I, when I'm, I only hate it for certain monsters. Some of some of them are better than others. So, like for those who are listening who don't know, so an apex monster has its own icon. It's like super hard. The idea is that it's like covered in this like mist and it's like dark and evil and glowing eyes and almost everything you hit on the monster, your attack bounces off. There's usually one part. It's very specific, like maybe the toenails or something of a monster. You can actually hit it. Um, But the idea is that you have to 
advance your uh, there's a facility in town and there's a special stone that you get that you sort of sharpen your weapon with and for like the next i don't know what it was like 60 seconds or something uh, you do a special type of damage to the monster where you can break it out of the apex state temporarily and so basically you have the hunters sharpening up with the special stones trying to go absolutely aggressively ham on the monster during the period that their stone is active which is tough because those monsters hit really hard so it's like totally like taking two aggressive hunters and aggressive monsters and doing a pit fight and so you get really aggressive and then if you're successful you'll break it out of the apex then everyone just goes absolutely crazy on the monster breaking it and killing it and then after a certain period of time it goes back at the apex state again and it was kind of this really cool rhythm where you had the most hard-hitting aggressive version of the monster you can think of like they just took the dial and they really turned it up and they made a mechanic that forced you to be aggressive against it and people absolutely hated it but if you look at like really gifted speedrunners there's people who kill these things without even breaking it out of the, like they know exactly where they can hit they don't even worry about it they just focus where they can hit and boom sounds like an interesting mechanic if even if oh, it man, is something hard. that it, it is something that requires quite a bit of maintenance from what i can tell and level they were tough one, as hell. Level 140 range Jonga. Good God. <laughs> level 140 Apex Rajang. Yeah. Oh, man. The memories. That, that was nightmarish. It's Sounds like take, like take Master Rank and try to come up. It, it, even the Arc Temper don't come close to the Apex, like in the terms of damage and aggression and stuff they can do. Like this was really just, I think they were playing around with how hard can we make these hunts? <laughs> and they really went crazy with it. Makes you, like if they're gonna, makes you wonder if they're going to try anything like that on Rise. It'd be interesting. But we, I got to mention this because I was tweeting about this about a month ago, but the the Gormagala, the weapon names, are I find so interesting. Um, they're German, I right? don't know. I, yeah, as I say, I don't know what they did with other languages. Like if you played the game in German, I don't know what happened. But in the English version of the game, the Japanese is hilarious. It's like the most childish crazy it sounds really stupid in japanese it's it sounds like a like a middle school kid wrote it and it was trying to sound edgy and they translated it into english but they they took the gormagala ones and they they used german words and i think they kept the same st silly structure of the japanese and then for shigaru they made them french <laughs> <laughs> so because like in the japanese is, is so refined it's so funny so like the um the Gormagala weapons uh, in Japanese was like this of nani nani, like or, of, of a word. So they had the English word of in there. So for like example, like the um, the great sword is called Pride of Doom. Uh, long sword is Steel of Judge. I mean, it's like the, the, you know, the claw of carrier, the power of enmity, the sound of doom, the shield of rage. Like they're all like, okay, what middle school kid wrote all this? Like some of them are just like real... The vision of Vanish. Uh, it, yeah. And then the Shigaru <laughs> weapons had the English word the, and then they had the word. So it was like the great sword is called the origin or the, the earth, the eye, the paladin, the fortress, the, you know, the miracle was the name of the insect. Label. Like who wants to run around with a weapon called the miracle? It just sounded really dumb. It's so <laughs> funny. But they kept the same thing in English, but they, they translated it into foreign words. So it sounds a little cooler. And different. I don't know what they did with the other languages though. Or the, I like the uh, the the palico weapon for Shigaru was uh, the Nyapuraiti. So it's like the they're taking Aphrodite, but they're calling it they're adding like the Nya at the top of it, the Nyaphrodite. <laughs> Wasn't uh, for you also the first game where Sergio was, or was that for you? Uh, Seregios, yeah, that's for for Ultimate. That's so Gormagala was the flagship Monster Monster Hunter Four, which never came to the West. But the West did get Monster Hunter for Ultimate, and so the flagship monster was technically Sedegios. Um, but I think everyone that, considered that one's a gore still kind of bugs me to this day. Like that many people know that Sedegios is actually a flagship. Yeah, Sedegios is flagship, and they're all like, "No, it's Gore Magala." It just shows you the presence that Gore had in the story. Yeah, but they play through it, and they still feel that Sedegios is not the flagship monster. Our favorite pine cone boy. Sergio Such, the pine cone. He's been like he's been like in like a weird loop lately. Like he's been forever stuck in the fortune for whatever reason. Yeah. So here's a weird question for you guys. This is this is more or less official Monster Hunter lore, but more uh fan community lore. 
But where the heck did the name Steve come from? Do you guys know? Yuri. Yuri. <laughs> Yuri did it, the community. <laughs> so Yuri is a community manager for Capcom in the US, and he's lovely. So he came up with it? From what I remember, yeah, it was him that came up with that name. Oh, wow. Steve. Oh, yeah, so whenever man. everyone mentions Steve, they mean Sedegios. It's just one of those things. I, j- I just started calling him Sergio. <laughs> and he also came up. He also came up with the name George for Gogbosios. Yeah, George. <laughs> George the oh oily boy. The oily boy. Who's, he's another one like me. He just wants to eat all your your gunpowder and stuff. He doesn't. He just wants to have a meal. And here we are killing him. But I guess we're putting him um, out of his misery as well. Gogmazus is from For You, right? Yeah. Yep. So what's what's the the thing? Like what what's his thing? Because like I, I I don't know anything about him. He produces this oily fluid that drips from his body. It's from its it's from his diet of well, it's from its diet of gunpowder. Since forgot what the I forgot what the exactly the um the material was that's found in gunpowder that he likes. Sulfur, sulfur, sulfur. Yeah, he likes. Agmosios likes eating sulfur, which can found, be found in gunpowder. And he usually, Agmosios spends most of his time sleeping underground and can spend a couple of decades sleeping underground before eventually waking up to feed. And when he wakes up, he ends up, he ends up destroying villages just to try to find more gunpowder, which contains the sulfur that he loves eating. And as he tries, as his body is breaking down the sulfur, he drips this oily fluid from his body that can encase hunters. And in some cases, that oily fluid gets objects stuck in his body like a dragonator. He has a dragonator stuck on him? Yeah. On his back. <laughs> so if you hit it, you can actually knock the dragonator off of his back and then shoot it into him. But his whole <laughs> so, theme is his whole theme is like torture devices. So he's like, he's really gothic. He's dark black and blues, lots of screaming, dark oils, explosions, you know, very uh, doom like themes. And all of his weapons have like torture device motifs to them, like cages with spikes and execution devices and stuff like that. Like he's truly dark. I love him to death. He's he's actually my icon on my YouTube channel (laughs) is is Gogma. And they even... And they even gave his weapon sleep to reflect the whole idea that he spends most of his time sleeping. Yeah, I love it. What what he's, element he, is he weak to with all that oil? <laughs> he's weak to his own element. Fire and so, dragon. Yeah. So he. I, I was I was wondering weak. if if he wouldn't be weak to fire when it's a monster that's like flooded with oil. Like that wouldn't make a lot of sense. And what I like about him, though, is he's got that little like silhouette of the frowny face underneath his chin. So he's got holes in his body where stuff is just dripping through and falling off. And the, the hole underneath his chin, it looks like a frowny face. And so in the trailer, they reveal just the frowny face and it looks really cute. Um, but that's but it's like a really like cool, dark monster. Like when you actually see it. Well, that's yeah, like taking like the book. frame of like Gore Magala and just going crazy with it. Right. Yeah. He really had us questioning what he was when they first teased him. Yeah, it's the frowny face. What is that? <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Yeah, Sad Face. Go on, I go on record and I say that my favorite Elder Dragon is, is Gogma. That's my, it's, he's my favorite. It would probably be Teostra for me. It, it really oh, makes agree? me wish that, that, they, that they would just like remaster that. They gotta remaster it, put it on the screen. It's just very hard so for me to play oh, 3DS at this point. On the spot, though, if you had to pick an Elder Dragon, so Dino's picking Teostra, I'm picking Gogma. Who, who, who do you think would be, at least at, at, at a flash slot? Because I know there's several monsters for both, you know, all of us, all three of us that are our favorite on any given day because we love them all. But which one, if you had to pick one right now? Uh, damn. I actually don't know. I think Jerry told think us if- it is. Okay. No, <laughs> you're a totus the elder dragon. No, it's just like I'm pretty sure that I'm forgetting something from from world right now because oh. like there's there's a few in world that I love, but I'm forgetting something at this exact That's moment. Fine. Who who's stealing but, uh, your 
your brain. I mean, it, it, it would probably it would probably be Teostra as well because like I remember the, nice. the first fight that I had with Teostra, um, because you know I just didn't know how to fight him. It was the first time that I was fighting him in World. Like I really like the introduction when your hunter's just like sneaking into the lava, and then you look at him and yeah. Teostra's just like there growling at you. And then I instantly died. And basically, what I did was I crafted the Damascus set because it was the set with the mo with the most defense skill. So I made a set that had yeah. like plus seven defense and I slapped my gun last and I was like, let's go. <laughs> and I beat his ass with a super defensive <laughs> set. But it was like, it was really bad when you think about it. It's like, it just took me a long time. And I think I still carded twice on the first time that I killed him. But yeah, Teostra definitely left like a, a lasting impression on me for sure. But the, yeah, for you, we could probably spend hours talking about for ultimate and just the monsters and, and the lore and the story. So that's genuine. To, genuine yeah, let's is. pivot over to well <laughs> let's pivot over to the other fourth generation game. Generations and Generations Ultimate. The <laughs> Faded Four. The best of, supposedly. The best of Monster Hunter, right? The top ten hits, the greatest hits of Monster Hunter. Yeah. So I mean Damn. I always like to I like to mention this only because some people didn't know and I think it helps if you're going to play it as you know, like, let's say you're waiting for monster to rise and you want to play some monster hunter. Like it's good to know the positioning of what generations was supposed to be because it's basically an anniversary title. It's like a celebra celebration title for monster hunter. So they don't give you a tutorial on anything. They just assume you know how to play the game. They didn't rebalance all the monsters perfectly to make, you know, to, to work with the new maps that they had. They just said, let's get as much stuff in this game as we can because it's a celebration. So they packed the living hell out of that game with different uh, styles, different monsters, everything, villages. And it's it's not held together by a, a huge a cohesive story or anything, but it really is a greatest hits of, of like the first four generations. So yeah, if it's your first monster in a game, I don't think it's very kind. Uh, yes. as it's, I, don't think it, I don't think it would work very well as your first monster in your game. You got to be Person. really dedicated if you want to play it. That and it had some of the worst gathering quests ever. Oh, my God. The first two yeah, hours. So yeah, the first two hours of Generations is what I always tell people. Like, look, the first two hours of this game, if you're someone that wants to complete all of the quests, these first, oh, two, the first two to five hours actually are terrible. They're just flat out terrible, dude. Like, you're going to hate it. If you're someone that doesn't but, care about yeah. completionism, then you can go and grab uh, M-H-G-U-D-B off of your app store or whatever, and you can see what the key quests are, and then you can just, yeah. like, do those and really quickly level up the ranks and get out of the boring parts of the game. It is very boring to start. Yeah, but lore wise, I love what they did. So they they have the the all four generations, right? So they had Kokoto back, they had Pokey from Gen generations, uh, second generation. They had they didn't have obviously Moga because they didn't have underwater, so they chose Yukimo for third gen. Then uh, for fourth gen, they had um, uh, Burna, which is a new village for this game. But I just love that they assigned a flagship monster to each village, a brand new one. Uh, so we got four flagships instead of one. So that was, you know, Glavinus, Mizutsune, Astalos, and Gameth. And Gameth, for those who don't know, is our first female ver uh, flagship monster. Because all the other flagship monsters had been confirmed to be male species or, or male whatever. I, English is hard for me sometimes, but... Uh, <laughs> the gender of the, the monster. I don't know what the hell I'm saying here. They're not female. But the gamut that we see in the game is an actual female of that monster. Um, so I thought that was nice that they did that. Um, so I don't know what you, what's your guys' thoughts on the, the Faded Four, as they call them. I know. Mm. I, I honestly love all of them. So I'm Team Asolos all the way. Team Asolos, how about you, Rui? What, what team are you, if you had to choose one? Uh, if I had to choose one of the Faded Four, I'd probably go with Glavinus. Is wow, like, you betrayal, man! And be, top ten animal betrayals of all time. Why? You and Eric's gaming. Go, oh, I don't know if you know. It's me and Eric's gaming who are good friends. We have a a, a fun ongoing uh, joke where we randomly will spit fire at each other and diss the other's favorite monster just for the hell of it. 
to like uh, his favorite is Glavinus. So I constantly are just shitting on Glavinus, even though I love the monster myself, just just for fun and giggles. And then he'll shit on Mizutsune because it's my favorite. <laughs> and then Kogath loves Gamoth, and sometimes we get him involved in it as well. It's hilarious. I really like Gamoth as well, though, but it's just Gamoth is not a super interesting monster to fight, right? It's at least I don't, I personally don't think so. Like, I don't think, I mean, basically, Gamoth is just one large hitbox. You just hit it until it keels over and dies. That's Gamoth, that's her one gang. weakness that I can't get over. Yeah, because like I, I love just, the monster, but yeah, I love the theme song. Speaking of Gamut. Fun. The interesting thing about Gamut is when a Gamut has a baby, she actually, she actually joins a herd of Popo, and she protects them. And the funny thing is, the real reason why she's doing that is to help her to protect her young, because huh. just like how T Rex loves eating Popo, he loves eating young Gamut. Bastard. <laughs> and. Since there's so many Popo around, Gamut often follows them to just try to um just to try Heard to give the Tigra four targets to choose from so oh. she can protect her baby. <laughs> I thought I thought when you said she I thought you said she would protect the, the, the little popos, but no, yeah, she's like, she's, she's like, no. No <laughs> blend in the crowd, right? Don't stand out, kid. Stay low. <laughs> I'll never see you. And as a baby gamma gets older, since it saw T Rex as a kind of bully, it's mm. its fear for T Rex slowly becomes hatred and yeah. baby gamma slowly becomes stronger and stronger as it ages and then it soon sees T Rex as well it soon develops this undying hatred for T Rex and well it now just hates seeing them on sight and will attack them when given the Kick chance. His ass. Yes. Is this actually reflected in game? Well, we get the ecology video, the two showing off. Sadly, on no. <laughs> oh, that's uh, like, it'd be cool if this yeah. was actually reflected in game. Like, a T Grex jumps yeah. into the thing and just like instantly, <laughs> like, that'd be cool. If only, if only Iceborne, if only Iceborne. <laughs> yeah, how come Gamoth wasn't an Iceborne? That was so weird. I just I got a randomly weird idea. Can you imagine if, if they did a system like you had with Behemoth where you draw the attention? If you're fighting a certain monster, if you're wearing the armor of, it's adversary monster that it will target you more often. That would be funny. That would be, that would be cool. I mean, I'm always looking for ways to get monsters to target me over other people so that I can actually make use of defensive skills. Like, well, that's because first... you're a gun lancer, and if the monster doesn't come to you, you're just standing there alone in the corner, right? No, not not really. It was mostly <laughs> because <laughs> when I was uh, I'm just teasing. When I was getting into the lance, I was like, "Oh, dude, I'm totally gonna make like a build and gonna have like." guard and guard up and like all of these defensive skills and defense seven yeah. i'm gonna put everything and then i was thinking to myself well but if the monster attacks somebody else then all of these skills are useless yeah, yeah those weapons are much more fun solo for sure yeah thinking about it let me each of the each of the hunting styles they actually have they actually have some kind of interest and origin to them let me see Guild style that's obviously that's obviously the style that the guild that the guild taught hunters. Striker, it's one that specializes with the hunter art, and it's presumed to be like possibly an older version of guild style, but it's hard to say. Yeah. Aerial style is actually it's actually a way that the people in in Barona actually that's the way they that's the way the people in Barona actually climb up mountains and stuff. And then there's adept style, which that comes from an eastern part of, I think I think of the Shikai, the Shikai country or the Shikai. The Shiki I forgot region. the name. God damn. Shiki, Shiki, yeah, it's the more Asian yeah. Japanese sort of area where Cathar is located. God damn longsword mains! I bet it was them. <laughs> <laughs> And Valor is the bug mode. That's the what the QA testers use to destroy stuff. I, I'm sorry. You both spoke at the same and time. And there's the hunter arts. And the hunter arts, they're basically, they're basically like random ideas that some hunters came up with while in the field during their many years of experience. Why don't we it's just try like this? something random wow. that the hunters just 
So that's just something they just came up with or just randomly came out of nowhere. It's just something that some hunters ended up coming up with during their many years of experience when they became, well, when they were becoming one with their weapon. What I what I liked about that system, and I don't have any examples like on paper to like mention right now. I can't think of any. But what I do remember about the hunter arts being cool is that when you unlocked like level three or level two or whatever of a certain hunter art, the monster that you fought, it kind of felt themed to it, right? Like if it was a really fast uh, hitting skill that you would unlock it by fighting a monster that was really fast and aggressive. Like there was almost like a connection there, which I really liked. I just don't have any good examples off the top of my head. There's still arts that I haven't unlocked. And like I got, <laughs> I have, I have 600 hours in that game. And it's like, I only play two weapons in that game, right? I don't even play that many weapons. I play two weapons in that game. Uh, sword and shield and the gun lands and there's still arts that i don't have <laughs> okay well, that's to give that you guys an idea I can't, <laughs> I can't remember which art it was but it's the one that where you have to do the um the silver and the gold rathian and rathalos at the same time that cursed I, quest i did that one already i think God. That, i think I it was, was, it was. Shield arts. Yeah, yeah that is a sword hyper and shield well? art. uh i don't remember yeah but i i had help i, I didn't they were hyper. That. <laughs> that, that was, was a nightmare quest. but yeah i, I know I, I think that might i think that might even not be one of the not even a level three i think it might be a level two because i still don't have like chaos oil level three that's one of the ones that i'm missing huh it's, it's like but i don't know it, it might be the other one it might be the the dance or whatever the sword dance or whatever level three might be that or it might be round slash three which round slash three for multiplayer sucks. <laughs> I kept like, I remember at one point I was playing with friends and it was just like, why everybody like, what would you do? Why'd you send me flying? And I'm like, what do you mean? I'm playing sword and shield. How am I sending anyone flying? <laughs> like, that doesn't make any sense. Because round slash three sends everybody flying for some strange reason. So when you're playing in multiplayer, you have to use round slash two. <laughs> Supposed to be a quote unquote support for people. <laughs> my team didn't see it that way <laughs> that's, that's at least that's at least what the hunter art says launch your launch your friends in the air so they can try to mount the monster yes they should be thanking you yes thank me for throwing you in the air and interrupting like, your combat. hey guys hey guys hey you want to try aerial style what ah! <laughs> No, but I, I, I really like the, the styles. But I, I was actually curious. Do you know like what the origin is for Valor and Alchemy, for instance? I actually don't. And I've looked for it previously, but I never found anything to go by. Because I actually became a massive fan of Alchemy. I love Alchemy for some strange reason. <laughs> Alchemy is so much fun. It's like... Shake the barrel. Shake the barrel. My running theory with Alchemy is that is that maybe there's something that the feline invented since it has to do with barrels. Yeah, I guess, I guess that would make sense. But, but Valor, I want to say it might be a variation of a variation of what happened with Adept, but hey. Val Valor's pretty yeah. busted. Um, so it's what about broken. the... Yeah, pretty much. So what about the other... Um, we talked about Gamoth. Uh, we didn't really talk we talked about Mizu already we talked about as Mizu well. Tonight, yeah. I guess uh, you could talk about Astalos since it's your favorite. <laughs> oh man, Astalos is an interesting one. He's he's despite his he's highly aggressive mainly because well he's smaller than a lot of the other predatory monsters in this environment because yeah, physically 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 speaking. Rathalos and Radian, they're stronger than Astalos, but he makes up for that with his elemental prowess. He's able to generate electricity by um, shaking his wings and various other parts of his body, thus, thus storing electricity in those parts and gaining that extra charge. And he uses that to its advantage in combat and while hunting. And by being super aggressive, both other monsters... Most other monsters can't really handle him too well, despite his smaller size. He reminds me and of this is going to sound so corny as shit. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. The interesting thing about it is that they're basically, 
the f- the parent the parent has to basically force their young to be that way because the rats they take care of their young but astolos they you just leave their eggs behind and then they just leave them leave their young to fend for themselves it's like sparta style yeah damn if you survive and come back the then, eggs, then you okay once the eggs hatch the young are on their own and they have to then they're forced to be aggressive to, um to survive and that's Poor but thing. on some rare occasions the young will sometimes eat their own siblings Animals. It's basically be, it's fittest. basically eat or be eaten for astolos. <laughs> I'm into vampires. So and it kind of so cannibals. it kind of sucks to be an astolos in a way, especially while you're young. Ugh. Damn. So he's like that's he's brutal. basically the the underdog. Young that's, that's so aggressive that it can basically take down basically anything. Uh, I'm sorry, I Crazy. didn't hear that. What? The underdog that basically can take on just about anything despite being smaller than most of the competition. It's pretty badass. I was going to say what sounds corny as hell is the fact that it's green colored. It kind of reminds me of like, you ever watch uh, the Mortal Kombat, the first movie? Reptile? Reptile. Yeah, yeah. Reptile comes out and he just like relentless just beating the shit out of Liu Kang. (laughs) Sort of reminds me of him just like. Aggression is the best defense, you know, it's just like, ah, I'm going crazy. <laughs> and I like the fact that he makes cricket sounds when you knock him over. And then, uh, let me see. Oh, you, you don't, you haven't heard that? Oh, yeah, if I, you listen I, for it, it's a little cricket sounds that you can hear when you knock it over. It's like, <laughs> yep, there's a lot of, there's a lot of incidents for Rachel Nastalos design. And let me see. Glavinous. Glavinous is a fascinating one. A lot of people think that ore, he's born with that ore on his tail, but he actually just rubs his tail on ore in its environment to gain that blade-like tail. And eventually... Tempered his own blade. Yep. And he actually has to do it often to, to maintain the blade's shape, so Lafnus generally, generally makes his territory around areas where large patches of that... where large patches of ore can be found, which... If you actually look in, the, in one of the areas in the Jurassic Frontier, you actually can see the same kind of ore it uses. Yeah. And the fascinating thing about it is he knows, he knows that by sharpening his tail, he can, he can maintain it. And when he sharpens his tail, he also swallows some of the ore and soot from it. And basically, and basically that ore boils inside of his flame sack and he's able to breathe, well, lava. Damn. Yeah, the, the 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 imagination behind that monster is great, right? You know, like great sword tail, sharpening it on the ground, biting his own tail to sharpen it with his teeth. Then the flint and all the chemicals from that results in him being able to breathe fire. Like, it's a great concept, and I love how they have him twist into like a like a circle, and then he just unwinds and goes shrunk with his sword. Big and he basically, he basically. It's considered to be like one of the smartest among the brute waverns, which you can actually pretty much see why. So here's like, here's a theory I've had that I would love to get your guys' opinion on, which is I originally thought that the styles were themed off of the flagships, where Gameth was guild style and more basic and more just, you know, holding your ground. Striker style was Astalos and more aggressive and using, you know, very aggressive hits and arts. Uh, Mizutsune jumps around a lot, so I thought Aerial Style was themed off of that monster. And then because of the sudden quick movements, I thought that Adept was themed off of Glavinus. Did you guys get that impression, or was it just me reading into it too much? I I kind of got that to a degree. I used to sometimes see Glavinus as Geld, Gamet as Aerial, Astalos as Striker, and Mizutsune as Adept. Interesting. Because of, because of Mizutsune's speed. I, I never even thought of any of this to be honest i was just like you guys are throwing this out and i'm like oh i guess i guess i can kind of see it but it's like at the time i never really thought too much about it when you think about it uh though glavinus also likes to jump around a lot he does his little hop sideways and then he does the yeah the thing where he jumps hits you with his tail so that could also be considered aerial when you, there's there's a lot of interpretations for it but i don't think that that was necessarily I think I think that maybe yeah. yeah I think that maybe you're reading a little bit too much into it. 
but yeah. it is a cool a cool thing if it was like if it was designed yeah. to be like that that would have been a let me see i guess we can talk about the deviants next yeah deviants and then we can go on to gu so deviants are are fun. What what is a variant? What is a deviant? The endless question that pops up in forums for monster. Oh, Hunter. the question is what is a variant and what is a subspecies? The deviants <laughs> are another thing altogether. Because <laughs> <laughs> the deviants are just variants, right? They're just a form of variant. They essentially are. They're just like that's the way I've always looked at them. Like they're just like a rarer version of variants. Yeah, like subspecies, the way I like to think about it is like you get like the polar bears, right? Where like because of the different environment, because of just natural selection, there's certain ways that in different regions, a monster will transform into something slightly different. Uh, for example, like polar bears, you know, like white allowed them to live longer because they couldn't be spotted in the in the snow. So they were able to procreate and make babies more. And then eventually, you know, only the white ones survived with the white fur in the polar regions. It's kind of like that with monsters. Like if they were born in a different environment, the naturally ones with certain abilities would would survive and make babies and selection would change them to adapt to their environment where variants, it could be anything from whether it's a situation like young Garuka, like maybe something happened when it was younger. Maybe it was just born with like freakishly good genes and like it just was really powerful and like had a certain ability or something. It's just, it's the same monster for all intents and purposes. It's just one of those weird lucky ones that came out of the batch. Um, or something situation happened that caused it to change its properties a little bit, but it's no different than the actual regular species. I think scientifically speaking, Crystal Beard Oregon, for example, he's his variation is caused by um basically sleeping in a special kind of ore that was rich in minerals and eating said ore, which caused its body to become redder and for crystals to grow on its chin and its tail. You are what you eat, guys. It's your diet that matters. <laughs> it is what it is. <laughs> and there's standards ones like Russ Razor Senator, which while young, it, it didn't develop a venom sock like the other Senator, which caused the individual to use his claws more frequently. And eventually, over time, it figured out that it could use a glove in his skull to sharpen his pincers to make them <laughs> oh sharper that's so cool i love that so much and let I mean, me see a cool another cool one is soul seer mizutane yeah. caused by it caused by an encounter with another monster it's turf he had a turf with said monster and it lost it it's lost his eyesight but over time he eventually he eventually compensated with his sensitivity via his fins and now mm. he can sense the various various movements of its of its surroundings just by using its bubbles yeah that was always a thing when we were hunting soul seer mizutsune it's like who's the first one to get hit by a bubble you idiot how did you get hit by a bubble <laughs> it was really funny as I, as I as i was doing research for my whenever i might make it but the video on mizutsune they had a interview where they went uh through the creation of its deviant and they said that one of the things they found with the regular Mizutsune was that a lot of people were able to avoid the bubbles and not get bubble blight. And so the, the, like, the concept from the get-go of the Deviant was it's going to be a killer machine that is going to cause bubble blight. And that was it. And that was like, they, they literally said like, it was like, like it's, it's the bubble killer. It's going to bubble blight you. So that was their whole focus was, was causing it to, to enhance those capabilities. Especially with those, especially with those flame and bubbles. Oh yeah, but I mean, I guess it it transitions us into generations ultimate a little bit. But I also love the story behind my favorite monster in Monster Hunter, which is the Bloodbath Diablos. It's like you know, hey, if you have those hunters that go around breaking the horns off of a monster and then leaving, you know, the same type of hunters that do like a you know investigations in world, they just break the horn and they leave. Like, okay, I'm out of here. So it like broke off. I didn't. Isn't the story like it broke off one of its horns when it was younger, and they just left it, and then it just like got enraged at hunters and like became like super aggressive. Yeah, Bloodbath is like he's like a special case where one hunter went after it and just broke his horn, and basically, and basically, the Diablos became extremely angry from that, and 
because that individual is particularly strong and got stronger over time, probably facing off against all sorts of other monsters, mm -hmm. covering its body and the blood and other bodily fluids of those monsters. That thing basically became a demon. Yeah. What, what is it like the opening of like Monster Four or something? We got to see like someone breaking off a horn of a Diablo. It was probably those guys that did it. <laughs> yep. And Monster Hunter and Monster Hunter Four Ultimate. Yeah. So, but like that monster, I, I that's I love it because it's like you got all these you got six flagship monsters in Ultimate, right? Which is crazy when you think about it. You've got all different. Every single element is covered, right? Valstrax has the dragon. Water with Mizitsune, fire with Glavinus, thunder with um, Astalos. And they already said from the get go, yeah, we don't want to have a flagship monster that's like a status ailment because it just feels wrong. Like, oh, it's a sleep monster. It's like, you know, it doesn't have the grandeur that it needs to be flagship. So they say, let's make a monster that has no element but doesn't need it because it can kick your butt anyways. And so they made him. And I just, he's so badass. Bloodbath was a pain to the hunt because like for some strange reason me and my friends decided we're gonna go make the bloodbath diablo set and weapon it was not a good oh, decision yeah. <laughs> that was not a good decision at all i <laughs> i probably hunted so that good. monster hundreds of times i love it so much it's it's, it's by far my favorite it's <laughs> one of my favorite deviants alongside bolt reaver astalos Oh, you, Jedi you just, Master Astalos. I, yeah, I was about to say lightsaber Astalos. <laughs> <laughs> I had a friend of mine that used to like, uh, because he plays Charge Blade, so he would be like, you know, Astalos would do his thing and he's like, okay, here's my version of it, and he would do Energy Blade. <laughs> That's hilarious. That is pretty cool. And then Valstrax, what, what, what you thought? I, one thing I thought was funny from a game mechanical standpoint with Valstrax is that they didn't tell people that they nerfed purple sharpness and no one really thought to look for it. It's just one of those things that everyone took for granted. Okay. Purple sharpness is like, what is it? 1.42 times your multiplier. So like when the game came out, at least in Japan, people were ignoring Valstrax weapons, which were hilarious because it was like all white sharpness and then all red. There was nothing in between. Just a huge amount of white, but then everyone's like, well, there's purple weapons. So we'll just use those. And then it came to light like a month or so afterwards. Oh, they nerfed it. Purple is actually not as powerful as it used to be. White is actually pretty darn decent. And so I, we, I saw a lot of people going back and then rediscovering Valistrax weapons because of the discovering that purple wasn't as strong as it was in the old games. Want to know why I couldn't do that? Because okay. it was shelling level four. <laughs> <laughs> That's fair. That's fair. Four. Four. Yeah, the maximum shelling in, in GU is five. You know, I look at it oh, and I see four rip. and I'm like, okay, thanks. <laughs> thanks, Capcom. <laughs> so, uh, Diana, do you, have, do you have anything interesting on Valstrax? It's Valstrax. a monster. I really I haven't into much myself. So, I love his theme song. Though. Valstrax is a pretty interesting monster that only appears like, supposedly, like every hundreds of thousand years. And. Uh, he, he always appears in places where there's a lot of dragon energy slash bio energy around because he needs that energy to keep his body fueled so he can, well, you know, fly. So he often moves from place to place in search of, search of energy pockets for itself to stay, to keep himself fueled, which is the reason why he reappeared in Ruin Pinnacle. So basically so, what you're saying is that Capcom has no excuse the fact that they didn't introduce him in Iceborne. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> With all this dragon energy and stuff built up, he would have been perfect. I, I guess they had to consider the maps, but who knows? Boo. I mean, the the maps in, in World are like much more compact than the maps that we had in the previous games. Like people see, oh, but it's a large open map. And it's like, yeah, but in terms of actual usable, biteable area for a monster like yeah. Volstrax that actually takes off, flies, a distance that you can't even see him anymore and then comes back down it just you know it, it'd be really hard like there's maybe that the first area in ancient forest that you'd be able to fight false tracks that's pretty much one of the only places in the game and ostrax has an abnormally high metabolism causing the skills on its just causing the skills on its wings to fall off often as he well flies <laughs> creating 
creating many meteorites to fall on the ground, causing monsters to panic and sometimes travel to villages to try to avoid of the incoming collision from those tracks as he's flying by. Sonic so, <laughs> so that's why, like, close to the end game of GU, we see we see a bunch of different monsters suddenly appear in various villages. Is Valshanks just flying around, scaring the shit out of them all? <laughs> yeah. Oh lord, he coming! <laughs> it fits with the whole natural disaster theme, which. He's just different from most other older dragons. His is just like more like he's not doing it intentionally. It's more like just something that he just passively does. Yeah, I can't help it if I fly like a missile. It's just how I was born. Do is is there any like statistics in terms of how fast he can go? Because he has to be like the fastest monster in the box. As far as I'm aware, just Mach one. He can go Mach one. The sound of. Yeah, he breaks the sound barrier. Damn. Like, that's impressive when you think that it's basically a living organism that is breaking Mach 1 in flight. Literally breaking the sound barrier. <laughs> that's pretty friggin' sweet. Hmm. I'm trying to think if there's anything else interesting to note about him. Like, what's the deal with him, like, charging himself up before he does his attacks? Like, there's, like, that sound where he, like, charges up his chest or something, and you're able to, like, interrupt him? Oh, he needs a lot of oxygen in his body because the air sacs in his body, they seem to produce the dragon er the necessary dragon energy he needs. So, also, he needs a considerable amount of oxygen within his air sacs to produce the dragon energy that he spews from his wings. Air goes in, dragon energy comes out. Like a pretty, pretty good much. deal. But cool. if he's not able to maintain it, well, the energy will explode in his chest, causing him to fall down. That's why it's a good idea to attack his chest while he's, while he's charging up. This is really funny. I was just looking at the Japanese wikia, and they said, well, if you take the, open, the movie for Valistrax and you calculate that he went from water level to clouds and clouds are basically 3000 meters up and he did it in three seconds he probably goes at about 3600 kilometers per hour <laughs> oh. we don't we don't know the distance from water to clouds in monster hunter world it could be a lot more it could i know be a lot it's less. so but it's that so is, funny how people that is go. pretty cool that that i mean i think it's pretty cool that someone actually you know went to the trouble of doing those calculations sweet yeah, well, that's another monster where I was again. It was feeding into my theory about the hunter arts because Valor style and Valstrax. Uh, it sounds like they come from the same root word. Brave, but yeah, it's called brave in Japanese. So it's sort of mm, yeah, brave stunts. Brave style. That's actually what I <laughs> what brave. I did at the start. I did. I think I was doing Valor Charge Blade. Valor Charge Blade is a ton of fun. Um, but there's another monster which is actually. Maybe even my favorite monster of, of GU. Atoka. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, baby. My second favorite of all. <laughs> Dude, he's so cool. What can you tell us about him? The first thing her. is, yeah, the first thing is all the Atoka we fight in game, they're female. And the thing is, back in ancient times, they used to use wood and stones to create their giant mobile nests. But as human as humans further developed over time, they slowly switched to the man-made materials we made since the tall car, they want to make their nests out of the best possible materials they can get their claws on. And since humans, since man-made materials are better than wood and trees, they ended up deciding they ended up deciding to just start stealing stuff from us to create the best that's <laughs> possible. So, in a sense, from humans developing, we changed their original behavior, causing them to create well, that metal monstrosity. She and is the, the cra- original silk bind user. Wirebugs. <laughs> yep. And the craziest thing about it was the nest in-game, it wasn't complete. It speculated that speculated that the nest would have been double the size if she was allowed to finish it. Let her finish it. Hashtag. <laughs> the Atal Nesset must be complete. 
if she if and she was allowed to finish it so it's not like we so it can't be made in game like they didn't program the bigger nest because it would probably cause yeah. too many problems in terms of gameplay yeah for a second there it almost sounded like well i mean she could it could be bigger but people keep interrupting it <laughs> if she was if she was allowed to like raid a few more fortresses she would have been able to complete it and it would have been much bigger and the current nest she has in game is actually bigger than even Lao Shen Long. Taller? That's, it's actually it's taller and it's actually longer than Lao Shen Long while he's on all fours, which is yeah. incredible. Yeah, the damn thing is huge. The thing is the the areas that we travel on it, you know, the the actual playable areas of it are not because that big. So I guess we don't we don't get to get a good sense of how big it is. Because Lao at least from one of the size videos, the most recent one, he's about he's about six thousand centimeters, but you're telling the set it's about nine thousand centimeters. Nine thousand? Nine yeah. thousand centimeters? It's over nine thousand. <laughs> that's like that's like thirty one lady Dimist Dimist <laughs> I can't pronounce her name. Never mind. I give up. I can't pronounce the name. <laughs> so just imagine how much bigger she could have made it if she completed it. It would have been twice as big, you said. F yeah. 50 of the Lady Vampires. Damn. Dude, and I want I want Atalka in Rise to get to complete. Atalka oh set. my god, can you imagine with the would be using wire bugs to travel on exactly. and jump around it? Oh my god, it would be so good. <laughs> I hope I she returns one day. I did too. Of all the of all the end bosses, I actually want her to return more than even even Gogma, who I like a lot. Obviously, Atal is the one I really want to see back. Yeah, they do need to balance the weapons a little bit better, though. <laughs> her weapons were just good. <laughs> Way too good. I don't know what you guys are Way talking about. Good. I'm a gunlance man. I mean, her gunlance <laughs> her gunlance wasn't bad. But, it was it was pretty good. Was it le was it level four? I think it was wide four. I'm I'm actually not sure, but it. it in the case of the Gunlands, it didn't really matter because that thing was just like a beat stick. You would just, you would actually dish out significant damage. Like when I, when I first beat her, I crafted the Gunlands and I was just playing, I think I was even going Valor for the infinite combo when, because like you get an infinite combo with the Lance, basically just spam X when you go into Valor mode and it just goes poke, 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 slam, poke, 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 slam. It doesn't stop. <laughs> yeah. So, so with you're, the gun you're lance, right, by the way. It is, it's, Wide four, you're right. Yeah, <laughs> see, dude, you can't you can't get one by me. Your memory is good, good, man. The the good thing about it was that um if you brought like handicraft two, it would have like so much purple sharp. Super long purple. And three slots. So and it already had like three hundred raw, I think. It's three hundred, right? Or is yeah. it three thirty? Three hundred thirty, right? yeah. Three thirty, yeah. And it had a six defense boost. Yeah, yeah. So it it was a it was a really good weapon. It was, but it wasn't the shelling weapon. <laughs> I just, I just love the Egyptian theme and everything with the whole theme song and how she looks. And it's the fact that the final online boss is actually just a little mantis. I love that. And she picks up dragonators and spins them around and hits you. With them. <laughs> I, I love whenever she picked up whatever that thing was that looked like a goddamn Ferris wheel and just like, <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> Yeets that thing across the map. And, and that's the thing. Like, even in the older games, like, the detail on the animations is so amazing because they can make this grass, th this praying mantis looking thing basically Spider Man grab something and then sling it around in a believable manner. And it's just like. In 240p. I, Imagine I, that. I, I, I think. Yes, that's like 240p. I think a lot of people like really underestimate the finesse that it takes to create believable animations. Because like you see that thing, you see her throwing. And it's not like it's going static. Like that thing is tumbling. The momentum's there, yeah. And, and, and it's like everything. there's there's no physics calculations there. That whole thing is hand animated because there were no physics, it's right? Amazing. In 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 Gen U, correct me if I'm wrong. I don't think there's a physics engine there. I, I wouldn't so, assume so, no. So none of that is like automated calc. Like that thing was hand animated and it is gorgeous. Just like, because like you can really, you can sense the momentum on it and the impact. Which is oh, and the like, weight, yeah. That's why I love that monster so much. It's friggin' gorgeous. 
Any uh, uh any other interesting factoids on Atelka? Actually, yeah, when she um this complete up oh, what's that? So your audio's cutting out again. I th- I think he I think he said one sec. Okay. Okay. <sighs> okay, I think it should be fine now. Cause Ness is complete and she raises her young. She'll she'll let her young take take a single piece from her nest and then young will build upon that piece and make their own nest eventually as they grow up. And inheritance. And while while they're traveling while they're traveling around in various environments, they'll base the look of their nest on whatever monsters they encounter. The case of Talka, she based it off a dragon. Mm. Oh, imagine one that that would like, one that would see like maybe uh, a different end boss, like I don't know, something that looks ridiculously like. So that she based it off of a dragon, like, but that thing almost reminds me a little bit of a cantor in a way. It's, I mean, it's got like the legs and like the tail. Bigger. So you're you're saying we can have a crossover event with Resident Evil Village, and we can have her build a device based off of a vampire lady. Yes. That will step on you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, I, I I need to scrub my mind. And I guess that leads us into world. World. I mean, world, I don't think we need to go like hyper deep on because I think it's being the most recent game and the fact that I imagine most people have listened to it and I don't have horribly much to add to the story. They, one thing I will say is I'm playing through Monster Hunter World right now with Yuna, my daughter, and we're having a really good time um, despite certain frustrations. Like it never it never hit me as hard as, as now that I know the, sto- the story of the game and going back and seeing all the story again because they won't let you skip any of the cutscenes, like seeing everything, they really overplay it. It's not that much of a complex story, but they really play the dramatics on it. Like it's something crazily profound that's happening, but it's basically just the same type of general story from the older games. Like, oh, something's going on. Let's find out what it is. Oh, it's a big monster. So I don't know. It's a big monster that was created from the energy of other dead big monsters. So here's a weird question to both of you guys. As I don't know if this is a just it bugged me or if it's it, it's not where Xenojiva I felt was great. I think that it, it played into the theme, the story, the way the world was moving. Like it, it seemed natural, right? But to me, the end boss of Iceborne just seemed to come out of absolutely nowhere. Like there was no talking about that monster. There was no hints about the monster. And just all of a sudden, oh, there's a final boss here we didn't know about. It just, it just seemed totally random to me. Was that just me or did you guys get that sense at all? I I honestly felt that for both of them, if I'm being honest. I'm going to be honest, I really mm. am not the biggest fan of Xenojiva. I, have, I don't hate the monster, I'm just not a big fan of it. Yeah. So, I'm actually kind of curious, because what was the deal with the tracker finding the, the ship? Like, what was that ship from? Like, it was supposedly a previous expedition that wound up in there. And it's got, like, the symbol of the Sapphire Star on it or whatever. Like, well, what's that whole thing? Because I, I felt like that wasn't really maybe properly explained in the story. I don't know uh, if you researched it. That was, that was her master's ship, from my understanding. She mentioned that her master had disappeared a long time ago when he went when he went to the Horfrost Reach. He don't know what exactly happened to him, but he did account for all all the various weird things that was happening in Iceborne, the mysterious song, the old wavern, the old the worm, whatever worm, and what else, and Volcana. He, he saw those events take place before, and he basically just left behind hints to to what we later on learned in the story. It's just weird. Yep. I just you have so you have so many cutscenes on it and I don't remember much of any of it. I just remember the he, the handler getting us in trouble. That's all. You don't know if her master's dead or alive, so who knows what happened to him. Master Julius, wanna... what? No. <laughs> Let me see. Do we know who the um, what's his name? Hunt Mast Hunts 
The guy with the long sword and the Rathian. Do we know who he is? We all we know is that he's an old time hunter from the old world, and that's it. That's There's a, a theory, the isn't there, that he's like yeah. from the intro of Monster Hunter Dose or something? No, I, I think it's yeah, from, from wasn't Monster it from Free the Unite. Yeah, Freedom Unite. There, there's that's, a hint that's that he's so, so. So that's not so that's not actually confirmed. Then it's just like we have a theory and that's it. Yeah, might confirm it at a later date, but as far as we know, it isn't confirmed. Yeah. One one funny side note here is when I was because pl- uh, Yuna is playing it in Japanese, I'm playing it in English. Um, this is a shout out to the localization team because I thought this was a nice touch where. When you drive off Zora Magnaros, he says in, in English, only took 40 years, you know, when, when he says we did it. Do you guys remember that? Yeah. He's like, he's like, uh, Commander's like, yeah, we did it. He's like, yeah, it only took 40 years. And uh, <laughs> in, the, in the Japanese, he just says, oh, that took a long time. That's it. It's not even an interesting line at all. He just says, yeah, that took a, boy, that was a long journey. That was it. So I was like, oh, wow, I didn't realize they really went that far with the characterization. I thought that was nice. One thing to note about him is his rivalry with Teostra. Yeah, who's going to bag the Teostra first, you or me? <laughs> <laughs> bag a Teostra. I love that, how he puts it. It's so funny. He's so what is that? Is there a story or is there any like reason behind his beef with that monster? He's always had an old rivalry with that monster back in the old world. That's one of the reasons he's hunted. He started, I think, two or three of them in the old world. And yet he wears Rathian armor. What a what a fashion hunter. He doesn't want to do mix up. Gotta go with the old times. He's never dropped the rare material. <laughs> <laughs> and so he can't Bastard. make the full set, so he doesn't want to do it. Yes. He doesn't he doesn't do mixed. He's like he's very experienced. Yes. He's the one who came up with the idea for the investigation system. Can we give the hunters a more higher chance to get the rare material? Because I was cheated way back when. <laughs> that would actually yes. make sense. That is that is a hundred percent the the reasoning behind it. <laughs> but um, but yeah, shot- I, I I do agree. Zenojiva, and- like, did- go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, no, you. Go no, ahead. I was going to ask um, Dino, like, if you wanted to go in a little bit more about certain aspects of Xenojiva that maybe rubbed you the wrong way or just you didn't find quite interesting? I honestly just find it's... I find this evolution to be kind of weird. That's all. Like, the way how he becomes what emerges from the cocoon and then eventually becomes, well, Safi. It's, it's a like, very fast transformation. I get what they were going for, but at the same time, just like... Yeah. I mean... Makes I mean Zeno Jiva makes sense out to me, but at the same time, it's like this can't believe they did the whole juvenile from juvenile to adult thing with an elder dragon again. Mm. That's I feel they could have done a little bit more with Zeno Jiva, maybe further expanded upon it in a different way. Yeah, it did feel a little weird to just all of a sudden we have the birth of this young, crazy new elder dragon that's never even been named by the guild and then. Not even a year goes by and it's like, oh, look, the adult is here. (laughs) What? Where did that come from? They would have said that the Xenogia we hunted just, well, just we never recovered the body of that Xenogia, so it might have still been alive. I've been like, okay, at least I can buy that. Because we do know some Elder Dragons do know how to play dead. At least that was the case (laughs) with Gore anyway. I mean, he would play dead long enough for us to chop his tail, carve his parts, and just like sitting there playing dead. Maybe, maybe if they take enough chunks out of me, maybe they'll be happy and they'll leave. Yeah. <laughs> um, I am curious though of uh, the validity of the the claims that uh, Rotten Vale is essentially the skeleton of the Lamador, right? The Lamador. Yeah. Yeah, the Lamador. It's it's confirmed, right? In the lore book, like the official encyclopedia, they say that it's made out of it, does, do, do, doesn't it? Hey, wait, what was it again? If the Rotten the, Veil is made out of the body of the Dalamadur. It's made, yeah, essentially made of seemingly two, maybe seemingly the main portion of the, the top portion is made out of two different individuals. Yeah, but it's totally confirmed that that's the monster, like that it's it's made out of. That's in the actual lore book. It mentions it, I believe. Yeah, they say it's either an abnormally large individual or 
some kind of ancient relative we've never heard of. Yeah, but definitely Dalamander related because we could see its yeah. body, the spikes, the the face, all that kind of stuff there. That's pretty. Cool. I wasn't I wasn't aware of that. <laughs> I mean, I I was aware that there was a theory that it was the llama. I wasn't aware of the fact that it had actually been confirmed in the lore book. Right? Yeah, I was kind of happy to see that. I remember when we first saw that one world when they first showed off game for the Ron Bells. I, I was just I had to look both little times because I was just surprised by that. Like, like <laughs> it could he be returning? Or is it just yeah, like, I know I know that game. shape of that spike. What is that's a Dalamater? <laughs> it's not a the giant pro- kezu, that's for sure. And the guiding lands were supposedly created from the corpse of Zora. Hey. That's that's the that a, that's the theory that it might have been created by by our Zora, but that's unlikely because the guidelines, at least from my understanding, it's been around for a long time. So chances are it's probably a different or magnus we never encountered. But Azora nonetheless. Correct. Yeah, we'll have to wait for that lore book coming this year and find out. Because <laughs> like uh Gaijin, you, you've seen You've seen the the thing in the in the rotten veil zone of the guiding lands that looks like the uh, or is the skull of Zora, right? No, I know. I've I've seen it countless times now. Plus, one thing is back at the volcanic region, that's actually the Zora shell. Huh. Interesting. Yeah. I I never thought I, I was so preoccupied with getting my darn levels up to like level five or whatever that I didn't even stop to think about. The construction of the the actual area i i didn't think about it like th- this is just from reading like my youtube comments <laughs> <laughs> like i make videos about stuff and then i learn about the lord by reading the youtube comments People are like oh man this is the skeleton of the llama door i'm like it is cool it's like oh man this thing is made from the body of, of azora magnaros and i'm like it is that's pretty cool <laughs> <laughs> i was i was actually not aware of a lot of it how about uh, interesting facts on Velcana, if you got any? Velcana doesn't breed ice. It breeds what's called super cold water that the water hits an object, it instantly freezes. And Velcana has this water inside of its body. And to control said water inside of its body, it covers its body in this blue ore that's similar to volcanic glass. Without that volcanic glass, it can't control the cold. Huh. That's why so in her that's why in her or... nest in her nest in Horfrost Reach, there's all of that glass stuff around. Yep, that's that's the kind of ore she usually covers her body in, and because there wasn't much of that ore during the event of Iceborne, Volcana ends up going to the new ends up ends up going to the new world to the volcanic region to make more of it since. She's running out of it in her normal nest. Huh. That's interesting. So you could say that Volcana really wasn't trying to be a threat to us. It was more so she was just trying to, um, this way to describe it, just trying to survive, trying to survive and control her abilities. That's why and we in, the, in the old world, we fight her in the Elder's Recess the first time on her. Yep. She was basically covering her body in that ore just to help to help try to maintain the control of her abilities. Because while well, Kushal Dayora molts in, molts in um, frigid regions, Volcana molts in um, volcanic regions, and replaces and cuff him rapidly freezes vol- rapidly freezes lava to create that blue ore that she uses to control her abilities. And, and one of the more interesting things is you've probably seen Volcana freeze other monsters before, huh? Yes. She, Volcana does that. Volcana does that basically to mark her territory. She leaves those corpses behind as a warning to anything that dares enter her domain. Doesn't even do it to eat. Like, shh, I'm gonna freeze these. And guys, remember, don't come in here. I'll freeze you up. Get nothing. Yep. It's pretty. It's pretty dark, but it's an effective way because I guarantee most creatures wouldn't dare when a dare stumble upon her territory. While she does that, yeah. So I guess the one thing that is left is a uh, good old shower. Because I mean, we talked about Zeno, the evolution. Oh no, wait. What about Colv? 
You got anything juicy on Cove? <laughs> She's an interesting one. Ovtarad's exact location is left in left as a mystery for the most part. The interesting thing is when the first fleet first saw her, she was in the Wildspire Waste. But later on, later on when the fifth fleet appeared, they found her somewhere deep within the volcan in the Elder's recess. Cove Kovtarat's habitat. Basically, the cameras of El Dorado can appear just about anywhere under the New World. As long, but a place can't exist without Kovtarat. But all Kovtarat to maintain the balance of that ecosystem, a place will actually wither away and die. So, Kovtarat's essentially a keystone species that's needed to, to maintain the ecosystem of the caverns of El Dorado. And we destroy that so we basically killed all of those gajalakas and the little crab creatures and all those critters that live there we killed all of them when we killed kul Tarath. in a sense yeah what was kul Tarath doing that was so bad for us though that we had to go we wanted to study our horns that's all <laughs> <laughs> That doesn't seem very guild-like. How did the guild sanction this? Let's just go. We we need to study her horns. We just got to figure it out. Okay. There's something about those horns that I I just I just can't sleep at we night might, thinking we, about. Yeah. Them. And if you don't get them within 25 minutes or whatever it was, you failed. We're done. <laughs> exactly. Go get me those horns, Fiverr. We're on a schedule. <laughs> like, Thing is, her horns are believed to be the key to how she's able to um adhere metal to our body it seems her it seems her horns can actually can actually control magnetism so that could explain how she's able to attach metal to our body so easily so they want to learn that in order to be able to craft better weapons essentially (laughs) yeah and better and better armor i mean it's it's basically a part of the guild's weapons program (laughs) yep like it, it, so that quest essentially from from a lore perspective like if we really analyze it to you know to to maintain like the the regular lore of monster Hunter, that quest doesn't even make sense considering that the guild's like say primary directive is to maintain balance like we're not really maintaining balance we're just going out there it's like no we got to figure out this technology to improve our weapon systems and our armor systems and all of that it's like damn all the rest it's like this has to happen and you just said yourself, we basically destroyed an entire ecosystem by hunting Kul Tarath. And Kul Tarath is actually what I consider to be one of the biggest problems of Monster Hunter World. <laughs> it's like, so it's even bad from a lore perspective. <laughs> like, what the hell? And she actually, she actually doesn't breed fire per se. Just more like she breeds, well, heat waves at us. Mm. It's extremely hot heat waves. Which her body temperature her body temperature can reach as high as four hundred degrees Celsius. Which oh wait it's, it's might actually it's actually twelve hundred degrees Celsius. Which is kind of crazy when you think about it. Which is how she's know. able to mow go which is how which is how she's able to mow gold to her body. But I, but that is kind of like it it just it reinforces the dislike that I already have for that particular hunt. It's like I don't dislike the hunt itself. I dislike like the fact that they made us. I mean, they didn't make us do any. If you want a meta right hat to farm gold to Roth until your eyes bled gold, that's pretty much how that worked. That sucked. Like I really hated it. And to now just like on top of it, from a lore perspective, there's not even a good reason to go hunt her. In terms of like the primary directives of guilt, it's just like, uh, okay, fine, I guess. Gotta just gotta study them horns. I guess that leaves oh. us with uh, with Shara. <laughs> there, there really isn't too much to say about Shara. All only real things I know about it is this: seems like the whole Ligiana migration thing that was caused by Shara. That just seems to be like a normal thing that happens every once in a while. So, could argue that we might have just we might have just harmed the Ligiana when we killed Shara, but I'm completely sure on that one. 
When we kill then, Shara, we uh, harm the Legianas because she causes them to migrate to warmer climates. Seemingly, seemingly, that's seemingly right around the time the Legiana migrate is when Shara Valda will becomes active. So it's like, maybe he might play a part in our migration, maybe not. Who really knows? Hmm. And he secretes this weird substance from its body that causes all the rocks and stuff to whelp build up on this body, giving them that golem-like appearance. That's pretty much it about him, outside of, well, the obvious sound vibrations his wings yeah. produce. Well, here's a hotly debated topic, which is is there there's and i i think i even i don't I actually don't know where i stand on it anymore um but there's the running theory that it's breaking the fourth wall and it's looking at you into the camera or is it looking at the hunter and it's really hard to tell because the way that the camera works is you're basically behind the hunter so it's hard to tell whether or not it's looking at you or it's looking at the hunter what do your guys take on that i think I'm thinking that Shari's Velda might be able to, to might be able to sense or see bioenergy. Which might it be that's my best explanation on that one. If we're trying to go like from a, end game universe aspect. Yeah. Be like a never ending story moment if it was actually looking at us, right? It's like Sebastian. <gasps> it I sees think, me. <laughs> I think it's supposed to be looking at you to kind of creep you out. That's something that my stream would always point out that because it, it does creep me out whenever I'm fighting Char and suddenly big eyes just like not looking at the hunter, actually looking at you, almost like breaking the fourth uh -huh. wall. And I was like, ah, stop looking at me. <laughs> stop looking at me like that. It creeps me out. Third eye whoa, opens up. And I'm just disappointed that from a game perspective that neither its armor nor its weapons really, as far as I can recall in my memory, had any use at all. It was like one of those monsters you hunted like once or twice and that was it? Or am I wrong? Was there something really good there? It's it was the updates that messed them over. Yeah. Because back, it's the back before creep. the updates back before the updates, his weapons were probably some of the strongest weapons in the game. Mm. Particularly particularly the, the hammer. Power creep like the, the hammer was excellent. I remember a lot of people using the hammer. Um but I don't know about the other weapons. I know that the hammer was like, I know that I didn't use the gun lance. Uh, I think I was thinking about using sword and shield or something. It's like, the weapons were good, but they weren't particularly, like, exceptional. With a couple of exceptions here and there, depending on whether or not you're willing to build for it. Uh, yeah. Well, it's up but, to the updates. It basically, it basically just sealed the deal that they were down. They were done for. Yeah. Pretty much. No, I think... Looking forward, I would, I would, I think a good way to sort of give my final thoughts on lore and stuff with Monster Hunter is looking forward at Rise. I know that there was an interview going around where Capcom said that they were trying to be a little bit more vague with the lore this time and they didn't want to really commit to like, okay, where, when, this, where does this take place? But the fact that we already have like, you know, the, um, what's her name, Rondina, uh, and she's got, you know, art and pictures from like Yukimo Village and, cheeky sand so it's like it takes place obviously in the monster in the universe and i'm interested to see what type of lore they actually do commit to uh as we get into the game because i still have my running theory that rise probably takes place if anywhere in aya which is like a continent almost like japan is like they, it's just one of those regions that we've never been to before and they said that it's closed its doors to other countries very much like old school japan you know and it would even make sense, uh, you know, like Portugal was one of the only countries they let in. So maybe like Rondina has a Portugal theme going on. I don't know, with greens and stuff like it would. It just sounds like because the technology and the skills they have, the fact that the other people in other regions don't have them is totally like baffling to me. You know, like you got these hunters who are using wire bugs and everywhere else. The, the guild hunters are like packing it on foot like idiots. So it's like I could see why they don't want to touch the lore of it, but. It seems like there's probably going to be some hints to it, which is interesting. I suspect, I suspect that it's going to end up being, I suspect that it's going to be ended up being somewhere, maybe not too far away from Yokama, maybe like, maybe like one of those land masses, one of those land masses mm. in the middle of the old world, which might explain yeah. some things. Plus, with ones, your microphone's cutting up. Okay, I'm back. 
As for some of the monsters you're feeling in the Frost Islands, I think it's safe to say that the Shrine Ruins, the Shrine Ruins in the Frost Islands are close to each other, thus meaning that Kamora is close to those two areas, which makes yeah. me wonder. Which makes me wonder how close the flooded forests and stuff are. I mean, yeah, because that I mean the Aya on the map, like it's right below where Cheeky Sands and the flooded forest would be, which are right below where Yukimo probably is, and then it would be right to the left side of where Cathar is. It would make sense, at least, I think. Oh, e word is hopefully makes sense. Yeah, but maybe maybe they don't give us anything. Maybe we ha- literally have nothing. No lore, no story building, and it's just a really fun game. I don't know. <laughs> we'll have to wait and see, I guess. I wouldn't be I wouldn't be against it as long as the monsters as long as the monsters have are detailed enough. That's true, yeah. As long as there's some backstory behind there, that's good enough for me as well. Yep, but uh, guys, I got uh, I got some interesting news here, which says that we've been going for about four hours now. Four hours. That's essentially wow. making this the longest third fleet podcast ever, which is probably going to give me problems in editing. <laughs> <laughs> You'll fight your one. <laughs> so um, I think we, we, we should... really scratch the surface. I feel, but it's been really fun. Yeah. Uh, especially uh, Dino having you on and just talking about monsters and story and locations. And it's been a nostalgic trip. All of those extra details that I had no idea of. I'm still a lot of these monsters. Jesus. I will never Christ. look. I'll never look at <clears throat> Gameth the same now and the Popos being used as bait for the tigers. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I always, I, I'm surprised that so many monsters are actually like just legit scared of Tigrex. They're just like, oh man, don't mess with him. Dude just walks into your house, drinks your beer, takes a poop in your, your freaking <laughs> bathroom, then looks you in the oh, eyeballs man. and leaves. Doesn't even have the decency to like throw the bottle away, just leaves it there on the counter. Doesn't even use like one of those things to, to set the bottle down. No, it just doesn't care. <laughs> it's either tolerate them or it's either tolerate them or die. Yep, pretty much. Anyway, guys, as per usual, there will be links to uh, Gaijin stuff. I'll put uh, links to uh, Bandino. You're on Twitter at and not Dino. See, see, look what you did, Gaijin. Band Dino <laughs> at Band Dino on oh, Twitter. <laughs> Do you have uh, anything else that you'd like to plug, Dino? Not really. I just, I just post lore whenever I feel like it at this point, whenever I have time. Okay, so I'll put yeah, a, just, I'll, I'll put a link to his Twitter I, in the description of the. Yeah, podcast. check out his Twitter. He's he's got some amazing like threads where he goes through monsters and does like a whole series and they're really fascinating so if you do follow them go through the back catalog of tweets there's some really great stuff so thank you for your work on that stuff i love it yep i I do what i can (laughs) anyway that's gonna be it guys we'll see you in the next one stay strong stay safe happy hunting peace